Um, basically, well, thank you, first of all, Gerhard, for setting this up and to everybody for attending. Um, I've spent most of my adult life researching and teaching the history of architecture with particular reference to the pre-modern architectural tradition of Japan. Um, my aim today is to introduce my area of study to you, but obviously there are limitations uh, to what I can say in the relatively limited time frame that we have. Um, and you have varying degrees of experience, so I'm going to try and do a kind of a general talk. And if people have aspects that they would like to hear more about, I can probably do that. Um, I was born in Cambridge in 1956. Um, a local family uh, basically um, had been farming or involved in um, uh, horticulture in the villages north of Cambridge from sort of the 18th century, one part back to the 16th at least and probably further. Um, most of my education, including university, took place in Cambridge. Uh, at school I was particularly into history and I went up to Trinity to read history actually, um, but I reconsidered after going up and I changed to architecture. And my thought at that stage was that it would impart skills that would make me a more useful person in the world. That was the sort of line. Um, and I thought, you know, just as a historian, well, I would end up teaching. <laughs> and of course, that is what has actually happened. So you might say that's maybe where I should have uh, kind of aimed myself. Anyway, um, I went I, uh, Trinity um very kind of kindly really allowed me without really investigating very deeply to to make that change from history to architecture but i have to say that in many ways i wasn't very well equipped to undertake the architecture course um though my father had was running an architectural office in uh, cambridge at, um uh, and had done so through uh, the post-war years down to the, the early 80s actually um, so architecture was sort of around me, but I wasn't very good at um, uh, mathematics or the sciences or physics, which should have ruled me out, but they allowed me to. Um, but history reasserted itself as I was working my way through the course, and I ended up writing papers when there was an opportunity on aspects of architectural history. And um, I, was, I wanted to combine history with architecture in some way or other, and whether that would be uh, conservation or of uh, historic buildings or really becoming an architectural historian, I wasn't quite certain. Neither was I quite certain of where I would, what I would specialize in. And um, it was serendipity, if you like, of meeting a Japanese person who was actually in Cambridge to learn English and happened to be homestaying at the house of a school friend and we became close and I married her. And that pulled me towards Japan. So in the last year of the diploma course, I ended up coming to Japan. And uh, at that stage, I had virtually no Japanese. Um, and I had to do something in quite a brief period of time. So I focused on urban vernacular houses, what the Japanese call machia. And I wrote a paper um, which ended up being the major part of my final year of the diploma course. And I don't think I was flavor of the month with my supervisors because my portfolio, we were allowed to weight it um, 60 40 portfolio or paper, and you could choose which you wanted to weight it to, but most people weighted it 60% to the portfolio, and I put 60% on the paper that I was writing, so the portfolio was a bit thin, and I don't think they liked that very much, but anyway. Um, but basically, I then went into an architect's office and was uh, continuing, if you like, the post-diploma business, heading towards becoming a professional architect by uh, getting the necessary practical experience and then aiming to take the exam. But I wrote to one of the people who had actually helped me when I uh, visited Japan to uh, make the paper on Machia, uh, who was a professor uh, or at that stage an associate professor at Tokyo University in architectural history. 
And I wrote to him again, basically saying, I'm interested, I've done a paper, and I'd like to do more about Japanese architecture. Is there any way that I could do it? And he wrote back almost immediately saying, Mondesho, the Japanese Ministry of Education, want to get foreigners into the Faculty of Engineering of Tokyo University. This was the early 80s and Japan was economically doing very well indeed. And they wanted to uh, help to raise a generation of Japanese innovators in the world of uh, engineering and the creation of, of new technical advances. But architectural history is a part of architecture, is a part of the Faculty of Engineering in many Japanese national universities. So I was eligible for this scholarship. And this man, who is essentially an architectural historian, um, uh, sponsored me and I got it. So that took me in 1983 into Tokyo University as a researcher. Within half a year, I entered the master's course. Then having done the master's over two years, I then moved on to the doctorate. And the doctorate took longer than it should have, but it was quite an ambitious thing to undertake. But that, anyway, I finally got in 1995. And then within a year, um, again, with, with help, um, I entered Chiba University as a lecturer in Japanese architectural history based, well, in architectural history generally. And again, I work, was working within a, uh, a faculty of engineering um, and a department of architecture within that faculty. And within that department, there's uh, what the Japanese call a kenkyushitsu. The, the people who work in Japan will understand what I'm talking about. In English terms, it doesn't really make much sense, but essentially they divide the department into a number of different labs, if you like. Kenkyushitsu is the ne nearest translation is probably laboratory. It means study room. And basically one study room consists of a professor, an associate professor and uh, an assistant, or it did. Um, that system has largely fallen apart, but I was taken in as a sort of subordinate, um, a, a lecturer who then I, I, I rose to be uh, associate professor and finally professor from 2007. And I've just retired because at 65, you have to. Um, so I'm now uh, thinking about what to do <laughs> next um, while doing other things. So that's introduction. It's probably too long, but does that, that puts me in perspective, I guess. Um, and so I've basically been teaching history of architecture and some conservation studies. So um, at undergraduate level, I've been doing uh, a history of Japanese architecture course, a history of world architecture course, um, a course in a, a summer course where I take students to visit historic buildings, basically usually a few days spent in the Nara Kyoto area um, and somewhere else. Um, uh, I was also uh, at, at postgraduate level, mainly teaching the history of the house, which was my special uh, subject. Um, and oh, other bits and pieces. I've done some design teaching um, and run uh, a course, which has been actually quite interesting, where I get second year students to a survey of vernacular house and then to make drawings of it. it's really teaching them to how to represent but it's also teaching them about the Japanese um, residential tradition and how uh, that was designed so that's me I think okay uh, anything anybody wants to say at that stage and then I it, it, after that I'll move on to my talk yeah great if there's okay. any questions anybody uh no in that case, yeah, why don't you go ahead? Okay, so I am now going to share screens. Uh, that's not properly. I wonder what happens if I do that. Does it work? Uh, Hang on, I think this will uh, work. works, works. You I can see, works. right? But I was wondering whether I might do it on the others because I've got two screens oh, here. Okay. Let's see how we go now. So I'm going to make this one. Uh, 
do that. And you can see, right? Perfect, yes. Okay, is this acceptable for everybody? Very good. Okay, so it's just going to be a general talk about Japanese traditional architecture. Day. Today, this is our image of Japanese architecture, state of the art, international trendsetter, and here is uh, Ken, uh, Tange Kenzo's um, uh, Tokyo Tocho, um, the main city hall of, of um, Tokyo. Uh, 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 Tange's second chance of designing that. This is Roppongi Hills um and the surrounding area so this is kind of the image and and the urban area surrounding it the lower rise residential you know you'd look at this and you'd say is there anything here that's old not really nothing much that dates back to before the second world war if anything and looking at this you say is this a country that has an architectural tradition that we can actually reach back to, and actually it is, and it has. And the characteristics of that architecture, well, basically to start with, they're using timber for the structural frame of the building. And as a result of the material, they, when, uh, the materials that they are using, we can talk about an architecture that is potentially in tune with the cycles of nature. Um, we're using, Timber, we're using um, uh, thatching materials such as reeds and uh, uh, grasses of different sorts. We're using bamboo, we're using earth. Um, and the earth for the most part, or the clay for the most part, is used unburned. So it's uh, clay walling, uh, something similar to the English tradition of um, bottle and door. Um, so we have an architecture which is sustainable, which is renewable, which is biodegradable, which is adaptable. Um, the principal material trees, and this is a scene from a 14th century picture scroll. Japan is very blessed with this kind of material. Um, these scrolls usually are telling stories and the number of scrolls will constitute one body of work. This is called Kasuga Gongen Genki-e. Uh, Kasuga Taisha is one of the big shrines in Nara and basically this picture scroll tells, the, tells stories about how the Kasuga, the divinity, the god of Kasuga has uh, been involved with uh, human activities, but there are scenes in it which show us, for example, here carpenters working on a building site. And if you sit down and really look at this, you can see how they were doing it. We can see they're using adzes to uh, uh, do the basic work of turning logs into uh, uh, squared off pieces or circular pieces. Then they're finishing with what was then being used that they they later developed planes which are quite similar to our concept of a plane but at this stage they're using a thing which is more like a spear which is called a yariganna and that was used to stroke the surface so you would get a smooth finish they're um using to uh something which i shall mention later the sashigane which is basically a square a carpenter's square we would call it um calibrated in ways which the carpenters were using in order not simply to make right angles, which it will do because it's a piece of metal like that, um, but also to, because of the way it's calibrated to uh, dimension and to work out the dimensions of all sorts of pieces. Um, they're also, now we, can we see a sumitsubo? We can see the master carpenter here and there's one here who's, can, can you all see him? This guy is visible, is he? Is my uh, yeah. Move this out of view. You see, he's holding a cane, a long cane, which is calibrated for the building that he's going to build. So on it, he will have um, markings giving him the sizes of certain key core members of the building, um, and also the height of the floor, the height of the um, lintel and probably the heights of ceilings and the top of the 
a frame. So this is basically made for designing that one, that particular building. Um, these sorts of members, okay? So periodizing, I'm not going to go into dates because that can get involved and take time, but we can basically talk about there's prehistoric, starting with Jomon, um, uh, which is taking us from about 8,000 BC to about 600 BC. Yayoi, which is taking us, some would say it starts about 300 BC and goes through to about 200, 250 AD uh, or CE, uh, we have to say now, don't we? Um, there is another school of thought which places the beginning of Yayoi about six or 700 BC, which I basically think is probably about right. And that's the age at which wet rice agriculture comes into Japan. The next is the age of state formation from Lake Yayoi through to Kofun, which is basically from about the first century AD through to the fifth or sixth century AD. And then the ancient period, the Aska um, through Nara period to Heian, taking us from um, about AD, uh, uh, 650, 700 through to um, the end of the 12th century. And then Kamakura is 12th and um, uh, end of the 12th through the 13th into the 14th. Muromachi takes us from the 14th through to the 16th. Azuchi Momoyama from mid 16th to, to beginning of the 17th. And then the Edo period from the beginning of the uh, from what six, depending on where you start, it's 1603 when Tokugawa Ieyasu becomes shogun, uh, um, or uh, 1615 after the fall of Osaka and the end of the Toyotomi period for good, and that runs through to 1867 to eight when we get the transition to the end of the back for the end of the shogunate and the return of power to the imperial house and the establishment of modern Japan, which is really from the Meiji area, Meiji, uh, Taisho, Showa, uh, to, uh, then Heisei and Ima, some Nengos run through. So uh, that's the basic periodization. Um, and it's interesting that they've got an ancient medieval and early modern which parallels the West. And this was a conscious choice in a way by architectural, by historians in Japan, that they were looking for analogies and finding them. And they're not, they're not entirely right, but they're not wrong either. There, it is, there is a reasonable uh, configuration of this sort um, uh, if we're looking through the history. I won't go further into that. Looking then at the architecture, we are looking at an architecture of timber, um, which as an architecture using timber is using joints. Um, so we are jointing timber to timber and we are fastening those joints with pegs, with wedges. Um, and what that means is that these very complicated joints are actually disassemblable. They're not using metal connectors very much at all. There were some, the most important are the, the, the nails which fasten the horizontal uh, beams which hold together a lot of uh, architectural frames of the ancient period, what are called nageshi. Um, though even there, probably the nails <clears throat> initially were made in uh, wood or even using bamboo and changed to metal over time. Um, other than that, it's all joints. So as I say, it's all disassemblable. And what that means is that you can reuse a frame and you can take it apart and reconfigure it in certain ways. And this they were very seriously doing pretty much right the way through their history. Um, where metal is used, of course, is in the tools. The tools that cut the joints were metal, though actually even there, if you go back into the prehistoric Jormon period, we don't have metal yet. And so this is a stone culture, but it, a stone age culture, but this stone age culture they had, they found excavated from wet deposits um, 
bits of building material which clearly have uh, mortise and tenon joints. And those must have been made using uh, stone tools. So you can do this. And we know they were cutting down trees with stone tools, so it's possible, but metal does a better job. So that's where they were using their metal, really. Now, most of the buildings um, are frame architecture, but they did make wall architecture with timber. Um, in other words, what? well, mostly in the West, if you're thinking log cabin, you're thinking uh, timber being used to make an architecture of walls. And the Japanese did do that in storehouses, um, what's called the azekra. Um, as you can see, essentially they are uh, logs laid horizontally, but the Japanese were using these for storehouses in which valuable things had to be kept for long periods. And in Japan's very humid summer kind of um, environment, things would deteriorate. And so they wanted these buildings to be hermetic. So their log cabin construction, the corners are detailed like this. They are actually making a triangle and then they're chamfering off the corners of the triangle. So they end up with a six sided figure and then they're jointing them at the corners, as you see here. So they cog in exactly, and there are no gaps. And they use this, for example, well, this is um, an eighth century example of a storehouse in Toshio Daiji, one of the great temples uh, of the Nara capital that survives. Um, the most famous of these is actually the short, what's called the Shoso Inn, which is the storehouse at the rear of Tor Daiji. And there, they have the personal effects of the 8th century emperor Shomu, which were put in there after he died in the, the latter half of the 8th century, and they're still okay today. Uh, now, Martin, uh, Oliver, you put your hand up. Is that, did you want to well, say? I, so Martin, we, we now know that timber is absolutely fantastic at yeah. uh, buffering the moisture content of buildings. Mm. And I'm wondering whether that was part of the reason why they used um, timber walls in these, um, yeah, I think these so. safes or whatever, you, whatever you might call them. I mean, yeah. certainly yes. highly protective settings for valuable things. Yeah, and it allowed it has allowed them to keep. I mean, when they go in there, um, fabrics, silk, um, uh, written stuff on paper which if you just kept it out in the open would simply have rotted or gone moldy and it hasn't um and all sorts of timber artifacts some lacquered it's just a treasure house of eighth century stuff that was just kept over um from the eighth century through until the 20th when of course they've done other things and taken them out and put them in museums some of them but some of them are still kept in there or returned to it um, so it's an amazing hermetic, um, it, it controls the environment. So from summer to winter in Japan, you have a great range. Winter is actually quite dry, not a lot of moisture and sunny. Summer is very humid and hot. And that range is covered. So within these buildings, it doesn't oscillate anything like as much as it does in the exterior. So this is one, but, but it's essentially this kind of walling is limited to these storehouses on the whole. And after a few centuries, they actually stopped doing it like this because it's very expensive in the use of the timber. So what they use instead is plaster and build up clay walls on the outside of a timber frame. And that works almost as well. Not quite, I think, but almost as well. Um, and uh, that also had the advantage of being fireproof, which this wasn't. Um, so you end up getting these fireproof storehouses with a timber frame on the interior and a built up layer upon layer of plaster on the exterior of that, which is used for later storehouses. Um, and because the uh, unfired earth absorbs moisture from the exterior. Again, the interior temperature and humidity don't vary anything like as much as the exterior does. So that works nearly as well. 
Okay, so that's as much as I'm going to say about the walling. Most of their architecture, those frame architecture. So this is a mock up at about, um, I think, about a, a quarter of the actual size of the Daigoku Den, which was the main palace hall of the Nara Palace, which they've actually uh, now, based on its archaeological footprint, um, they've rebuilt full size. But this is in the Heijo Palace um, uh, sort of information hall area. They've got this mock up. And you, what, what you can see is that basically you are using uh, posts and um, horizontal members. Um, so across the building, we have uh, beams and along the building, what the Japanese call girders. And uh, if you build like this, in terms of use of timber for the area that you're able to achieve, it's obviously much more efficient than the log cabin kind of construction that we just saw. Um, so you get a lot of space for the amount of timber that you're using. And that's the basis of um, pretty much all of their architecture. And potentially it also is extremely flexible because between the structural members, which are supporting the loads from above, which are the posts, um, that space can be used any way you like. So you can open it, you can put in openable and closable partitions, or you can build what I've shown a little bit of here, which is a plastered wall, which has basically uh, bamboo and wood as its sort of inner frame. And then to that, to hold those in position, you're using straw rope and twining that round. And then on it, you are building up uh, in layers uh, mud that the mud closest to the frame is the most clay and that basically sticks to the frame and you want to get it through the holes so that it's keyed in there when that dries it will crack so then you have another court coat which you put on top of that which has a greater admixture of sand in it and you let that dry over a week or two. And then you put another layer on with more sand. If you want to get to a, a white, clean white finish, you then make plaster, which they would basically make by burning shell and then grinding it up and then adding to that a mixture of water and um, uh, seaweed or a pulver pulverizing the seaweed to get a kind of gluey substance out of it, which can then be mixed with water, which gives it um, adhesion. And that white mixture can then be uh, a clean white finish um, to your plastered wall if you want it. So you're building this up layer by layer. And um, when it's all set, it becomes uh, a firm wall. And so you can close one space to another, but it's not fired. So if you want to, you'd add water and you can melt all this down again. And when they do, um, when they repair historic buildings, they very often do that. They reuse the old walling material. They take it off and they add water and they mix in a little bit more straw. The, the, the lower levels tend to have a bit of um, chaff sort of um, mixed in with them. So this is very much what in the West we would call wattle and daub. But it's uh, and, and finished then to a kind of plaster. So that's what they're using. So it is, in fact, uh, at that level, very similar to the kind of technology that we were using in uh, the medieval centuries through to about the 17th century when brick begins to come in. Um, they never used brick until Meiji in walls. They used some fired clay in tiles, but the use of tile too was actually quite limited more of it as the Edo period goes on, but before that, very limited, actually. OK, so that's uh, as much as I say about this. And how then are we working on the design of buildings? Well, the essential module is the inter-post span, which the, we would call a bay and which the Japanese call a ken or a ma, but usually ken. So a building 
Uh, this is a diagram made by an architectural, well, a designer, but also a historian named uh, Kojiro Yoichiro. And he's basically saying the simplest is to have one post. And then we can put two posts and we have uh, a bay lengthwise and we can have two, three weeks. So we can make um, fences. And then we can start to make a square. The, the simplest architectural space is basically going to have inevitably uh, a square bay of four posts. And that is, if you like, the most sort of basic building that you can get. You can, the easy thing to do is to lengthen it along the line of the ridge by uh, lengthening the number of bays. You can also increase the depth, but increasing the depth means the limit there is going to be the num the, the, the length of cross beam that you can secure. So uh, if you're doing it in one span, so that was usually two bays. Bay length could be varied within uh, according to the status of the building, and could even be varied within a building. Um, uh, sort of uh, the, the central bay being wider than the flanking ones, etc., depending on how you're doing it. Um, and buildings can, their sizes in ancient architecture in particular, are often expressed in terms of bays. So how many bays? And the bay, usually it's the length of the building is expressed in. So a building like this is a three bay building, a five bay building, a seven bay building. Um, and that forms usually a core is two bays a core can be one bay but we're now looking at a cross section so for example a building like this has a cross section where basically you have a full height frame which is two bays across and that constitutes what is referred to as the moya of the building and then um, we have these two flanking areas, the aisles of the building, um, in our terms, which the Japanese call hisashi. So moya and hisashi and hisashi. And this is basically organized in terms of we have the core and the peripheral zone of hisashi. In this case, the building has hisashi all the way around it. Um, here's a building where basically they're conceiving it as it has a certain a central area of moya and then hisashi on both sides. But you can have a building where you've got hisashi on just one side. So the whole thing is being conceived in terms of sort of central bays and then the number of hisashi. You can actually go beyond one hisashi and have two hisashis. They call the main hisashi is a hisashi. The one the an outer hisashi is, is usually called a grandchild hisashi or a mago hisashi. So this is the ancient frame. Um, and that's one module. But another module emerges, particularly in the context of domestic architecture, with the emergence of the tatami mat. And the tatami mat is initially uh, a sleeping pallet. It's designed to fit the size of a human body. So typically it will be three feet across by six feet in length. In Japanese terms, sanjaku, three shaku by six shaku. Their shaku is more or less um, like, the, <coughs> as is the Chinese shaku, the equivalent of our foot. So they're thinking in feet, which is very easy for me, um, as someone who grew up with feet before meters really kind of came in in my childhood. So you can look at this and, and it makes sense. So this is a sleeping mat or a sleeping pallet, which is, uh, it has a soft top and it's about this thick, about two inches thick um, on average. You can have, there are thicker ones, um, but mainly. And um, these are, relatively they're not like the payas of the west which is actually quite floppy they're more like our pallets and we did have them in medieval europe and there are descriptions of them and they were used for sleeping for servants and so forth in great houses nobody had except the top people had beds 
most of the people were sleeping on on pallets in um who, who were sort of serving in these houses and the japanese are basically doing the same thing so you'd sleep on it but you can put a, a sort of little cushion in the middle and sit on it during the day and the japanese leap forward is when they actually start putting these uh mats these tatami over the entire surface of the floor of a room because they then become modular generators for the space so a three mat space will always be six feet by nine feet now three feet three feet three feet a four and a half mat room will always be nine feet by nine feet basically i mean there's a slight variation in tatami size um six foot ones to six and a half foot ones so you get a slight difference according to period and uh area but essentially we think of it in those terms it's easy here is a six mat room which is always going to be 12 feet by nine feet the eight mat room is always going to be a square 12 feet by 12 feet the 10 mat is always going to be 15 feet by 12 feet so these are then generating room sizes particularly in smaller buildings and the point at which you um make the length of a tatami, your standard interpost size for an entire building is the point at which the tatami planning system and the older bay system are united into one. Does that make sense? Okay, so these are the two modular concepts which really underlie their planning um, in buildings that are non residential that do not have um living rooms and and before these were spread over the entire floor then it's going to be a bay system that's determining it without reference necessarily in bay interpost span um to the length of a tatami but when you get into domestic you're going to get it um being increasingly uh organized around a, a basically a six foot interpost span so this is showing you using again these incredible scenes from these incredible medieval uh, uh, illustrated hand scrolls. Um, this is a mid uh, 14th century one, Bokie Kotoba, and it is showing us an interior in a 14th century uh, monk's uh, residence within a monastery. And uh, he has gathered some friends, some of whom are aristocrats, another monk is also there and they're in a raised floor wooden floored room of ancient period type and they are arranging tatami around the edge of the space that they're using so they can sit on the tatami and they're having a linked poetry session where each person has to make a line of a poem and the next person has to extend the poem in accordance with the sense and the the, the rhythm um and this was their idea of a party and at the back you can see that the servants are making the food which is going to be brought through whilst they're doing it so this is early use of tatami and you can see there can be carried this is this monk in this particular view is carrying a tatami because another guest has come and they want to lay one out for another person so uh, he's bringing it so this is how they start this flexible use of them but then a century later this is the same bokie this picture scroll was damaged uh, and two or three scrolls were lost. And in the mid 15th century, they got an artist to redraw the lost scrolls. And he redrew in the style of the mid 15th century. So a century after this one. And by that stage, we can see the entire room is now covered with tatami. So in that period, if you like, we've got this the beginnings of this transition to the idea of the tatami not just being around the edge of a room which might otherwise not particularly be uh, dimensioned so that it could be entirely laid out with tatami to a situation where tatami are laid over the entire floor so they are generating a module of the space um, and we're also getting the built-in tokonomo alcove and we have here he's got a study window projecting into the veranda and you can see he's got his desk with his book open on it um, so we're moving into the world of the developed showing style of residential architecture just at this period and tatami the extension of the use of tatami is central to that 
Okay, so now we'll, I'm moving to make a comparison between the ancient frame. Um, this is actually the frame of a building which the core of which actually does survive because it was recycled to become the core, the, a part of a temple building. Um, but they can look at the, the actual timbers and look at the unused joints on the timbers, which allows them to reconstruct the original form of the building, which was an aristocratic residence or part of an aristocratic residence in the Nara capital, Heijokyo, which was recycled and passed to a temple. So in its initial form, it was a moya, here we have it, Hisashi building of classic type with post and beam in Japanese terms, hashira and hari. And then here we have a shorter hari, which is um, actually tenoned in to form the frame of the hisashi. So irigawa bashira and gawa bashira. Um, in a, so if you like, uh, aisle post, uh, or nave post and aisle post in our terms. So a very similar concept to that. This is uh, an eighth century aristocratic building. This is a section of a 17th century farmhouse. And you can see again, we have four, a four bay cross section and a very similar concept it looks like, though uh, life is a bit more complicated because there are various interpretations of this. One is that these are posts that have been truncated and originally there would have been posts here and here and not like this. I think it isn't quite like that, but anyway, in Minka terms, so these vernacular houses are called by the Japanese Minka, um, and this, the central part is referred to as Joya, which means upper house, and then the two flanking areas are known as Gea or lower house. So a similar concept. Uh, and the upper frame here, we are using elements which are called sasu. Um, to, sasu means to pierce in Japanese. And what this is, is basically the ends of these members are tenoned into the top of the uh, beam and they rise up to support the ridge. So we have a triangle created. And because they're tenoned in, they pierce the top. So they're called sasu or piercing members. And the same concept exists in Minka a thousand years later. We have these are Minka sasu, which come down and pierce the top of this cross beam. And then we have a vertical one here just to help them, which is called a tsuka. Um, the frame is usually divided into uh, the uh, lower frame, which is called the jikubu, and the upper frame, which is called the koyogumi, the uh, roof frame. Um, so again, jikubu and koyogumi. Um, similar concepts, but subtly different. Um, I put in a lot of names. I won't go through all of this. Um, but I will briefly mention the way in which this frame hits the ground, because these early buildings are earth fast post buildings. The building is being secured, if you like, by sinking the uh, base of the post into the ground and securing it there. And if you do that, obviously the ground prevents it from moving. So your upper structure can be, it, it isn't going to move very much unless there's an earthquake. Um, but as time goes on, uh, this tends to rot. And the next stage is to say, well, this is rotted. This is probably still all right, but it's in the ground, so we don't use it. So what we then do is we put a, uh, a stone in and we bring the post down onto the top of the stone. This is called ishibadate and becomes the most common way of dealing with the relationship between the post and the ground. Um, <clears throat> earth fast posts continue to be used at the vernacular level into the 18th century. Um, though they're getting fewer and fewer and more and more buildings are like this. The next development is to say we will not just have stones under the posts, but we will run sill beams, the Japanese call them dodai, along the ground, and we will have uh, stones underneath those to hold them in position. The pic some of the pictures that I'm going to use 
are from the uh, the guidebook to Nihon Minka N, which is um, a, a museum, an open air museum of Japanese um, vernacular houses. Uh, there are a number of these, but this one is in Kawasaki City and is called Nihon Minka N. And uh, they had a very well written um, guidebook in Japanese by Satoshi Ono uh, and Tetsuya Yasuda and Hiroshi Okada. They, um, they needed an English version, so I and a group of volunteers basically organized that, and I did that in my sabbatical year. So I I'm sort of using some of the pictures from that, but if anybody's in Japan, if you want to get an overview of uh, vernacular house types in um, uh, Eastern Japan, um, this is a good place to go. It's in Kawasaki City. Uh, the nearest station is Mukodaoka UN, and from there it's a 10 minute walk. So I believe it's quite close to where Gerhardt lives. So somewhere that we might one day have a, a trip to for the Chinese Japan people. So I'm using now these are pages from that. And these are giving you this is vernacular housing of the Edo period, but it, it's giving you a sense of how these frames go together with posts. And then at the top of the posts, you've got Keta, which run along the building, and Hari, which run across the building in principle. So the ridge is running this way, right? And you've got, so the Japanese will talk in, if they're just talking about a building, they will talk in terms of Harima, which is the space across the building, the cross section, and Ketayuki, which is along the building. Um, uh, you have the Jikubu is the lower frame. There is, if there's a raised floor, then at the lower level, there are going to be members framing that floor and supporting it at uh, intermediate points. And that is one element that offers stability to this frame. The other elements are at the top of the, the jikubu, where the uh, keta and the hari uh, meet. Um, and then on top of that, when that's all gone together, we have the koyagumi, which is the roof frame. And around that are typical joints showing how these go together. I won't go into detail, but this, for example, is showing you how the various members, the cross, the, the um, uh, what they call orbiki, which basically are the supporting members for the uh, main frame of the floor, and then uh, nuki, which are these very uh, slender, the, the width is very slender, but their depth is considerable, and they are actually designed to slot right the way through a post and often to be jointed in the middle of it. So they are Japanese bracing frame, uh, members. On the whole, the Japanese within the lower frames of buildings did not go for diagonal bracing, which in the West we tended to use. A lot of medieval um, bracing in the West is diagonal or is arched influenced perhaps by the Gothic style and so forth, the arcuated style of architecture, which, which the Japanese didn't really have. So they weren't doing that. And because of the way they wanted to keep the interposed spaces potentially openable for sliding panels and so forth, they didn't want diagonal bracing. So they're not doing that. So any bracing is horizontal or vertical. Uh, and that's what Nuki are doing. Um, a whole range of these different joints. This is the joint matrix. This is where the sasu goes into the top of the beam. This is jointing the two sasu at the top and combining them with the tsuka. This is a very important joint matrix. This is looking at what happens at the top of the post. And that is actually crucial because the question that arises is, do you put the cross beam, the hari undermost and the keta on top of it, or do you put the keta first on top of the post and then the cross beam on top of that? It might sound as though it doesn't really matter, but actually it does matter. And if you think about it, you'll immediately see why. If you put the cross beam under the long beam, if you like, the, the hari under the keta, then you need a post wherever there's a cross beam. If you want to put your posts more freely, then you need the keta underneath because the keta can run along and then the positioning of the cross beam doesn't have to coincide with the position of a post. 
So we tend to move from this, the earlier regular pattern, assuming posts at every bay point, to a point, uh, an idea where the, the uh, keta, that's to say, this member underlies, so then you can emit posts. Okay. Now this is an sorry. Yeah, what have I done? Uh, this is an ancient, or, or this is an early modern Minka frame. Going into the 20th century, they're still building houses like that. Um, the house of my wife's family was built in the early 60s, and basically it wasn't as big as this, but it was along these sort of lines. So they're still putting together their timber framed houses and jointing them in the traditional way with the joint matrices. This is from a panel in the Takenaka Carpentry Tools Museum, a wonderful museum of Japanese timber construction in Kobe, very close to the Shin Kobe uh, uh, Shinkansen station. So that's basically to say this um, tradition continues even in post-war Japan, but it's increasingly disappearing with the uh, use of uh, prefabricated kits, which use smaller scantlings of timber and more modern uh, metal connections and things of that sort, um, which we find in a lot of designs by housemakers, so-called, who are um, they're increasingly dominant in the Japanese individual housing market. So there is still a lot of timber buildings, but less and less with quite this kind of classic framing. Looking then at finishes for roofs, um, their thatching, of course, was important. And that is something which is quite similar to ours. So I've decided not to go into that. But this is something that we simply don't have, which is used in a lot of elite structures upper class buildings, temple halls, and residential halls, where what they're using is actually the bark of cypress trees. Hiwada buki is what it's called. Um, hiwada is, um, he is the hinoki, the cypress, and hada means skin. So actually this is the bark. So they strip the bark off the trees and they do this without killing the trees, which is impressive, but they take, they know how to take bark from trees and literally, I, there, I've seen um, uh, filming of them doing this. I've never actually seen it in the flesh, but they abseil their way up the trees. And from a high point, they start the straight trunks of these trees and they put in a little cutter and then strip it down right to the bottom. They get a long, long strip of bark about this width. And then they're going to cut that into lengths. And that goes in like this. So the lap is considerable. You've got quite long pieces which are just being lapped like this. So the amount that's sticking out is very little. The rest is hidden up. So you've got quite a thickness of this bark and that is then used to uh, form the roof. And they're holding it in place with nails. These are the nails, but the nails are actually made of bamboo. So bamboo makes excellent nails. It doesn't last forever, but then neither does this. So every 30 or so years, you're gonna have to redo it and the nails will go too. When they're doing this, it's an incredible sight to see them. The, the guys who are doing it put a huge wad of these bamboo nails into their mouths. And then they take some of these and they climb up the roof and they put them in position and bang, take the nails out of their mouths and bang them into place. And you end up with a roof like this um, and it just covers the entire area of the roof. This is how it looks in section. So the, this is the amount of buildup that you have and then a timber frame underneath it. And in this case, it's the kind of typical upswept uh, eaves that we're familiar with, with Oriental architecture. They're using tile. Classic tile is the original type coming from China with an over tile and an under tile. And the over tile is a cylinder which had a piece cut out of it, if you like that overlies the joint between the under tiles. So this is, in Western terms, what we call through the Roman period and then in the West right the way through and replaced in the West by what we call pan tiles. The Japanese call them sundara and they appear in Japan um, from about the uh, end of the 17th, beginning of the 18th century. And uh, I have a colleague at Chiba University who was researching this, who came up with probably it was Dutch influence that helped them develop the pan tile. Before that, basically, they'd used this heavier 
uh, Chinese style, classic style known as Hongdara. Uh, this is just a section um, uh, in the Heizhou Palace site exhibition to give you a sense of how that's put together. Okay, so now we'll look at uh, the uh, frame of a roof. This is the Japanese uh, truss used particularly in elite structures where you didn't need to reuse the roof space. Usually in Minka, they wanted to use this space. So unless they've got a tiled roof, they tend not to do this because if you do this, you can't really use the roof space. But in uh, elite buildings, they weren't so worried about using the roof space. So what you do is on top of your platform of beams, you set um, upper posts, which are called ska, which support purlins, roof purlins, and then they are locked in place with these penetrating ties that I mentioned earlier, which are very thin and but quite deep, which actually run right the way through the post, which are called nuki. So this arrangement is called a wagoya. And then we have uh, ceiling types. There's the neda tenjo, which is a load supporting ceiling. These joists mean you can use the upper floor um, either for storing stuff or for people to use in a multi-story building. And then there's the non-structural, the non-load supporting salvage tenjo, um, which is actually supported from the beams above. So it's hung from the beams above and these, um, the sao that form um, the, as it were, the joists are actually very, very slender and they couldn't possibly span the spans that they span if they weren't supported from above. So this is uh, in vernacular houses, um, uh, a bamboo ceiling over which they would quite often lay some earth that or a clay layer, and then they would use this for a loft space. So that's the ceiling arrangements. Um, different ways of making a floor. The Japanese have totally unfloored spaces that they call doma, but most living areas were floored, even if the floor wasn't raised. The uh, simplest type in a lot of vernacular houses until well into the Edo period, uh, at a sort of average peasant farmer level, basically you would have um, a member um, which runs across to block what is actually chaff or chopped straw, which is maybe uh, this deep. And that forms a soft uh, surface over which you're then spreading matting, not tatami, but just thinner um, uh, matting. And that forms a living surface. So that's what poorer people were doing. But wealthier people were using wooden floors, which were raised and supported by uh, a frame. Um, so that's entirely a timber floor. And then within that, you can you have uh, the uh, these are shiki, which are actually um, the runners for sliding panels. They're set proud of this floor. And then this depth is the depth of tatami. So you can spread tatami on this floor. Then we've got, um, for example, uh, we can have uh, what is called uh, a sunoko floor, which is made from bamboo over which you spread thin matting. So that's uh, floor treatments, uh, wall treatments. Where you want open bays, they're using a lot of this. Sliding panels with two runners so that they cross. Um, and these are various sites, types. There are solid timber ones. There are uh, translucent paper ones where the frame, the frame is obviously a slender frame of wood and then translucent paper is set into that used around the edges of buildings to provide light because they weren't using glass until the 19th century um, when it comes in from the west basically. So uh, shoji panels and then opaque panels between rooms where you're not worried about light, they again could be finished with paper. Um, there are panels where you have uh, horizontal members on a timber uh, base, as it were, timber board base um, called mairado, so different types uh, of sliding panel. Um, they could be just pairs. If you omit a post, so you can have two bays open, you can have four um, to uh, a two bay opening. So all of this is allowing you to open the space. Then you've also got uh, elements that swing up, 
which are called shtomido, were very common in ancient architecture, but still used particularly in urban houses to open, make the fronts openable um, for use as shops in the uh, early modern period. Um, so you've also got swing doors. Um, other things that you will find is, for example, the entrance to a sleeping room would usually have a solid panel and one side slides open. Um, you can have uh, some of the interposed uh, spaces, particularly in reception rooms, but originally in study rooms, would have uh, staggered shelving on which you kept writing materials, um, uh, a, project, a desk that projects into the enga, that's to say the area of uh, veranda that goes round the building, um, and uh, alcoves that you could hang hangings in for decorative purposes um, called tokonoma. So these elements come into particularly elite uh, uh, residential architecture. Um, so these are different ways in which interposed can be handled. So the next thing I was going to go into is the use of bracket complexes, which are not very much used in domestic architecture, but were widely used in temple buildings and in some formal palace buildings where you have a bracket complex basically between the top of the post and the cross beam and the long uh, purlin running along the building. So in Japanese terms, hashira, hari and keta. And between them, you're slipping in this uh, uh, element, uh, which we in English would uh, translate as a bracket complex, which the Japanese are calling a kumimono. And this is a simple case, but I'm now going to talk about the essence of kumimono. So this is a delightful little diagram from a book about Horyuji, Sekai Saiko no Mokuzo Kenshiku, the oldest timber building in the world, um, uh, written by some architectural historians in collaboration with a brilliant architectural illustrator, Hosomi Kazuo-san, who is it has I mean, the, the books are beautifully illustrated so that children can understand them basically um chugakse and um kokose so from middle school through high school and this gives you the concept of the kumimono so if you just have a post that comes up to um the keta that runs along a building so we're looking along the building parallel to the ridge it's like just having the thing sitting on your head, if you think of a person as a post. If you want to actually spread the load a bit and stabilize things, you put up both hands and you uh, can provide a bit more stability. And the Japanese do that with an element which is called uh, a hijiki. Hiji means elbow. So a hijiki is an elbow wood, ki meaning wood. So um, that's the, mo the most sort of basic element. The other element is the bracket block, which is called a mass or a tor. And it can just come up, in which case it's really doing what this is doing. This is giving you more spread. Then you can say at the top of the post, we will have a tor or a mass. The mass is the Japanese pronunciation, tor is the, the Japanese version of the Chinese pronunciation. And then we have the Hijiki, and then we have two more tor. The little one, this is usually bigger, called the dai tor, a big tor, and these are little, so they're called makito. And it's like doing this. Yeah. Then we could have three of them where it's like putting the head and the two hands. And this is called, so we've got the the dai tor, the main tor on the top of the post. Then we've got the hijiki, and then we've got makito, 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 three makito. And the Japanese refer that to that as a hira mitsu to. Hira means along the building, and three mitsu is three, and to is these things. So three to along the building. So that's the hira mitsu to. And it's along the building. And what this is allowing, you see, is what he's drawn here. It means you can joint the keta that runs along the building. You can't joint hari if they're clear spanning across a building. They have to be one piece. But along the building, you can if you do something like this, because there's support both sides. 
So you can take a joint at midpoint as you run your build. So you can lengthen the building along the line of its ridge. Okay, so this is the starting point. And this is the basic one where you have what just this. The Japanese call that a funa hijiki because it looks like a boat. Funa is a boat, so a boat hijiki. And that's found in residential architecture, but more complicated ones usually aren't. This is daito and hijiki, a combination of the tall at the top of the post and hijiki. This is too tall, usually used where there isn't a post, as an interpost um, relation between the uh, what's an, an element called the kashiranuki and the uh, uh, purlin that runs along the eaves, right? Then we've got the Hiramitsu door, which is this one. So all of this is along the building, and that's where this starts. But where it starts to get interesting is where you say, we're going to use this concept, and we're going to turn it through 90 degrees, and we're going to start projecting it from the eaves of the building. And that is going to allow us to deepen the eaves of the building, because we are able to push out the uh, Eve's Perlin uh, beyond the wall face. Yeah. So we start by taking the Mitsudor and pulling it out. And that's called a Demitsudor, Deru meaning to come out. So it's a Hira Mitsudor, which is actually a Hira Mitsudor in two dimensions. And that's supporting the end of a beam here. And then on that, you've got a certain amount of over, uh, overlap so, so that your eaves are being pushed out. Then you start to take it one step further out. This is what's called hitote saki, one hand saki forward. So one hand forward. And that means on the top of this, you're now sticking a hiro mitsudo and you're raising up the line of this eaves pearl in. And then you can say, well, we've done it once, we'll do it again. And you get a thing called a futate saki, two hands forward and you put your Hiramitsu door on it, and then they add another member, which is called a Sane Hijiki. So this is a Hijiki, this is a Sane Hijiki, and that supports the eaves pearl. So you're getting a greater depth of eaves. And finally, you get to what's called the Mitesaki Kumimono, which is the three steps forward, the three hands forward Kumimono, which is used in the most prestigious buildings of the 8th century and the, the early classic period of Japanese architecture. Um, this, in effect, is pretty much entirely borrowed from Tang China. And this is a section that I drew basically by a hand-drawn section for students um, uh, to help them to just draw this without. This is done entirely freehand, just judging by eye. So it's a way of making them really look at how this goes together. This is the eaves of the Kondor, the golden hall of Tosho Daiji, which is one of the great temples of the eighth century. This building is probably the finest surviving piece of Tang architecture in the world. China doesn't have any Tang buildings as old as this. The oldest Tang buildings in China are a century after this and they're more developed. So this is giving us an earlier stage of Tang architecture. And basically what's happening is we've got the Daitor and an element linking the tops of the post, which is called the Kashira Nuki, a head Nuki, the only Nuki in the buildings of this period. And then we go one step forward, uh, one step forward and a, and a second step forward. And then we introduce a member called an Otaruki, O means a tail, and taruki means a rafter. This is not a rafter in the sense that it's supporting a roof, though it probably was generated from a rafter that did support a roof. Um, and what they're then doing is they're putting that in, and they're putting a another uh, mitsudo, as it were, another one of uh, these things, on top of this, and then supporting the eaves purling. And why are they doing this? Because up here, they're going to counterweight it. So there's load coming on it from a tiled roof from here, and that stops it overturning, so you can take this further out, away from the building. 
And what you then do is you put a rafter in, which again projects, and then you put another bit of rafter, which they call a hiendarki, a flying rafter, and you load this again with clay on which tiles are bedded. And its load up this end is always countered by load at this end. So you can project, you can cantilever because you're counterweighting. And that is the key to understanding how all this works. And the raison d'etre is they wanted deep eaves because they want to keep hot, high summer sun out of these spaces. They want to keep rain out of these spaces. So a projection, which um, this is uh, maybe 10 feet or uh, 12 feet tall. So this is actually projecting sort of 12 feet beyond the line of the outer uh, posts of the building. So you're getting a very deep eaves and it protects you. And that was prestigious because only the rich could afford to do that. So that becomes the key to the, as it were, the, the order that underlies this architecture. And it gets more complicated. This is fast forward 600 years to the uh, medieval period, what the Japanese call the, the Zen style, Zen Shuyo, when the Zen sect comes into Japan from the continent in the 13th century. And these are the kind of uh, bracket complexes that we get at that stage. We now have not one uh, tail rafter, but two tail rafters, a much more complicated kumimono, and it's a much smaller proportion uh, relative to the height of these rather slender posts. Um, much more complicated, very decorative, more decorative in a way than functional because actually most of the load is being taken by a hidden roof, which is up here. This is all out of sight, hidden behind what look like structural rafters. They're designed to look like rafters, but actually they are entirely aesthetic elements. And the real member is this, which is actually a huge piece of timber, which is carrying load here, which counterweights it so it can project beyond the line of the eaves here, way out to this point. Because it's loaded here, it can't overturn. So you can get a deep eaves projection. Uh, and that's what they were trying to do. But all of this is decorative. And this is basically the, where China's architecture has gone by the 13th century. So this is Song China. And the one we had in the previous one is Tang China. So we, are, we can see the development of the Kumimono from Tang through to Song. Uh, reflected in Japanese buildings of the ancient period and then of the medieval period. Um, I won't go into more detail on these, but if you are interested, it's a fascinating thing to look at how these elements develop uh, and uh, function. But I do want to say something about the way in which they're designed and proportioned. Japanese architects were carefully proportioning and relating the elements of their buildings. This is uh, a diagram made from the written description in a carpenter's manual written in the year 1608 called Shome. It was written by the master carpenter, the head of the Heino Uchi family of master carpenters who basically were running their own uh, architecture and construction company, if you like, serving the Tokuga Bakufu at the beginning of the Edo period. And they were skilled carpenters. And basically, this uh, uh, carpenter's manual was what's called a hidential. It's a sacred, a secret manual. And it actually says on the uh, scroll, on the outside of the scrolls, it's all written on scrolls. Um, this is under no circumstances is this ever to be shown to anybody who is outside the Heino Uchi organization and the top of it. This is their knowledge, their secret knowledge, which is not to be imparted because in this lies their skill. And if other people know how to do it, they've got competition. Of course, the other families that were doing this had their own. Um, this one survives and is now in the hands of Tokyo University. It was edited and uh, 
basically has been issued so that the whole text is available but the person who edited it very kindly drew out the written explanation so that we can see because they just wrote it in words there are a few plans and a few diagrammatic plans in this manual but almost all of it is composed in words and what you realize as you uh, see it, well as you look at his the, the text is that and from what he's drawn out is that we are in talking entirely in terms of modules rather than actually specifying dimensions they choose a module which is very often the diameter of a post so that's your key module and everything else is related to that so if you want to know how to size the ditor that stands on the top of the post you divide the diameter of the post into five and you take the central three are going to be the main part of the data and the curved bit is going to be the outer fifth on either side so that's the dimension and then you can see they're also relating the spacing of the three uh tall on the hiramitsudo here's the the hijiki, the daito, the hijiki, and the three makito, they're relating the spacing of the rafters above to these elements. So one makito is one rafter, one space, and one rafter. And the space between the makito is one space as between, so the space is actually the same as the dimension of the rafter. So then that unifies the whole thing. And the sane hijiki that sits on top in here is again one space and one raft apart so the spacing of the rafter and the organization of the bracket block by the edo period not earlier but by the edo period it's all being coordinated and this kind of credential tells us how they were doing it how they were conceiving it and all of the members are being proportioned relative to other members um, but of course when you get to domestic architecture the tatami is effectively six feet by three, so that tends to generate actual dimensions. So in the part of this five scroll book, which actually talks about residential architecture, you get fixed dimensions related to the length of the tatami more than you do in others. This is the kairumata, the frog leg strut. Um, it means frog's crutch, and that becomes an element which is used between posts to take intermediate loading and transfer it to this kashira niki um, this is the diagram these are um, full-size replicas which have been made in the uh, uh, carpentry museum um, of the takenaka uh, uh, corporation that they found the carpentry tools museum in kobe that i mentioned earlier okay so now we're moving on to how you make these kind of upswept eaves. Now you might think that if you're proportioning and sizing all of these members, you'd make your diagonal piece and you'd kind of measure from the diagonal to the face and then you'd cut each one on the basis of this. But actually they don't do that. What they do is they, they, they cut it all before they fit it together and it all fits. So how do you do that? you use this the key to it is this element the sashigane which i mentioned earlier this carpenter square which is calibrated in actual dimensions on its front face and on its rear face it has dimensions which are 1.41 times the the actual dimensions on the front so on the front you've got it say divided into sun ten sun being in one foot so their inch 10 inches make a foot whereas we have 12 inches to a foot so one sun on the front will actually on the other on the reverse side for part of it will be 1.4 sun in length and that is because diagonal members are coming in at 1.4 times the the root two if you like of that um corner that's how you can dimension you can use that to dimension the rafters as they come into the hip rafter 
And they're doing more like, cleverer things with this because they use the um, right angle triangle concept, the hypotenuse and the main. So this is a, uh, a sorry, no, here, here and here is what we're actually talking about. This is the going, this is the height, and this is the pitch of your roof. And this is always 10 units. Relative to the 10 units, are you going up five or six or seven or eight or nine or 10? And that checks, so this dimension will change and that fixes your pitch. And so they're doing that and then using the various triangles that they create to create the right angle on all of the members that they have to cut for that roof. So all of this is actually done by the carpenters who understand this. I only half understand it. They understand it and they can uh, do what's called sumiske, which is actually fitting in all the pieces, uh, uh, sizing all of the members um, and marking them up so that they cut them to the right size and the right uh, uh, angle to fit them all together to make the joints. All of their architecture is very sophisticated in terms of its fitting and detailing. So we have expressive range and technical virtuosity at every level. I'm here um, contrasting um, a, this is actually part of the Karamon at Nikko Toshogu, which is the mausoleum of the Dokna Shoguns. And it's beautifully elaborate, uh, carefully carved members, and they're all perfect and they're curvilinear and you've got a lot of sculpture, wooden sculpture in here uh, and uh, decorative motifs cut into the beam members. It's finished in lacquer and precious um, coloring materials and metal gold plated uh, metal fittings are being used. So a sort of Baroque architecture and it's perfect. And then you've got contrasting with that, the kind of vocabulary that was permitted to ordinary people, farmers. This is a village headman on the Kujukuri Hama in Chiba prefecture. Um, he's actually the head of a village which is partially agricultural and partially involved in fishing on the coast. And um, this is the main room of his house where he gathers uh, the local family heads to discuss how they're going to run things. So this is sort of prestige space for a village headman's house of the 17th century. And it looks rustic. You look at these and you think, well, they're just using any old logs. But look carefully at what is happening here. These lengthwise members are all meeting at interbay points and this one lies over this one but the next one we find this one overlies this one and then we go on a bit and we find once again this one underlies and this one overlies and then they're doing the opposite again so they are knitting these elements together and he's using trees so he's cut the branches so he has had to work out and fit these various members so that at each bay inter uh, interlocking point as it were they actually touch so that load is transferred and along this line this is the end of the room you see you've got a post at one bay intervals coming in so there's a post here there's a post here and a post here and then here he's got a post in the plane of the wall, but he doesn't want posts in the middle of the room, so he's omitting them. And in order to omit them, he has to transfer load using these members. So that's what he's doing here. He's actually omitting a line of posts. So it's very cleverly done. So although it looks rustic, it is actually very skilled architecture, very skilled carpentry. So we have highly uh, skilled craftsmen building these buildings at pretty much every level by the Edo period. Okay, I've gone on too long. What shall I do? Am I talking too long? Are people keen for me to sort of draw this to a close? 
you can go on for as long as you like. There's no limit. If people uh, have, uh, I, 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 would like to pick up on anything, I mean, I don't know. But if you like, we can make a little break for questions now. If there are any questions, please come in. And if there are no questions, right. uh, what I was going to do, the next thing is basically dividing, looking at categories mm -hmm. and introducing you to buildings in the various architectural categories and talking a bit about that. So if this, what I've talked to uh, so far is, if you like, sort of the general yeah. strategy. So if people have questions or things you'd like to ask about that, then I can okay. stop here for a few minutes and do that. Does anybody have questions? Please unmute yourself and ask. If there's anybody, uh, Chicago, for example, do you have a question, Chicago? Uh, mm -hmm. uh, do you have? A no, uh, it, it's fascinating, but uh, um, not at the moment. Just I, I was curious about the insulation uh, between those uh, storehouses in Azekuratsukuri hmm. and the common uh, uh, storehouses made with mud. Hmm. The, how they differ. Uh, I haven't actually, I, I don't know in detail. Um, I think probably the timber ones were extremely effective and they were, they continued in use into the early medieval period. And we know that, have you heard of uh, Shigisan Engi? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. In Shigisan Engi, there is a beautiful scene uh, where it's telling the story of how a hermit up a mountain is uh, saying his prayers and he's hungry and he's so busy praying he can't go and get his food. So he's rice, he sends his rice bowl, which flies to the house of a rich um, merchant in Yamazaki and the rice bowl picks up the storehouse that contains the, the um, store of rice that this rich merchant has and brings the whole storehouse to the uh, uh, monk on his mountaintop. And the building, it isn't a raised floor storehouse, it's laid, actually laid on the ground, but it is an Azekura. So we can see that Azekura actually used into the 12th century, but from then on, they sort of stopped doing it. There are still some wooden floored storehouses. Sorry, that is my uh, email is just integrated. Let's get rid of that. Um, I think the transition, I don't know about performance. The reason I think that they changed was the amount of wood that it was using um, and perhaps also fireproofing that mm -hmm. the clay storehouses were better in fires. And they were using them, the, the um, emaki that I showed in this, my almost my first slide, the Kasuga Gongen Genki of 1309, has a scene where there's been a fire and the only building that survives is this clay storehouse with actually a clay roof as well, because it had an outer building right the way around it, which is completely burnt. And they have, um, put some uh, uh, itado and fusuma around to create a little space in front of it, but they're actually living in their storehouse and it's got already got um, uh, hiraki tobira, which are also plastered. So we know that they were do building them by the early 14th century. Thank you very much. So that's about <laughs> when. Mm -hmm. And people have done research into the effectiveness of those um, earth storehouses, the, the dozo, um, they've done fire tests on them and that's fascinating. You light a fire on the outside and for a long time, the moisture that is within the clay wall actually prevents the heat from getting into the storehouse. And that all comes off as steam and when it's all gone, what you have effectively done is you have fired the wall. So it then prevents fire from getting through because it's become um, basically a fired lump of clay. Actually, uh, Martin, with my company, we worked on M&A, you know, buying, selling of companies between a European company, a Japanese company, both of them also in modern day. Mm -hmm. 
uh, fire proofing of uh, of buildings yeah and the materials they use uh, yeah part of the materials they use today work in the same way as you just described mm. well the, the, i mean it's extremely effective can anybody guess what the uh downside of those thick clay walls was so they were building for example Meiji is almost their golden age. You get these incredible misegura, which cost a bomb to build because they were building up the clay levels over several years very, very carefully and then finishing them with um, not white plaster, but black plaster, which has ink mixed into it. So it's black and then it's polished. So it's sort of shiny, it's beautiful. But they stopped building them. And there's a caesura. Well, if it takes a couple of years to be, then uh, that's no, it wasn't that. It was 1923. The, oh, earthquake. the earthquake. Earthquake. When you shake a building like that, everything falls off. The, the 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 outer clay walls have basically no tensile strength, so they just crack. Mm. And once they've cracked, the fire can get through. Mm. And that fire basically happened at lunchtime when everyone was busy cooking their lunch. And so the whole lot went. And after that, they said reinforced concrete and abandoned it. Mm. But actually, there could be a reuse if one put into the framing, into the, 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 the clay walls layer by layer, if you put something in that would actually a kind of mat layer to prevent that happening. If you consciously did that, you probably could work out ways of making this highly potentially a, a very sustainable way of making a fireproof building something that could survive in an earthquake zone. But I, mean, uh, yeah. I mean, earthquakes have been around in Japan forever. Yeah. So uh, why didn't that... Uh, why didn't they appreciate it before? Well, <laughs> yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? But um, 1923 seems to... Perhaps it was just a bigger one, did more damage. Um, but they were <laughs> conscious of it. You do, and and I think their notion was that uh, buildings, particularly in urban areas, were going to burn, and basically you were going to have to rebuild after an earthquake. There's an emakia, late Edo period. I think it's late Edo, not early Meiji, which actually does show that whole process. We have the 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 a picture of the actual earthquake and everything fall, well we have the prosperous town then we have the earthquake and everything falls down then we have the fire and everything burning and then we have people living in the ruins and then we have them rebuilding and basically this is the cycle that they sort of felt was inevitable but i think in 1923 they decided that they weren't going to let it be inevitable that concrete was an answer that would solve that mm -hmm. okay um, so uh, thank you very much Thank you, Chicago. Yes, many thanks for that question. Uh, Martin, why don't you carry on? Okay, bit? so I'll talk building categories. Yeah, that's okay? great. Yeah, so basically, the Japanese are seeing they convenient for convenience sake, they're dividing architecture into six categories um, the uh, shrines of the indigenous religion. Uh, the Shinto religion, so the shrines to the Japanese kami, the Japanese gods, um, exemplified here by Ise Jingu, which is the shrine for Amaterasu, who is the goddess of the sun, who is also the ancestress of the imperial family. And then Buddhist temple architecture. Japanese, in, working into English, use the word shrine for Shinto, and temple for Buddhists. I personally think actually it's a bit of a misnomer. These are really temples if we're thinking in terms of a building that houses a god, whereas Buddhist temples, so-called, are actually places where monks are living to serve images of Buddhas and so forth. So this is closer to our concept of a monastery. So uh, the term monastery might be more appropriate for Buddhist architecture and temple for these, but uh, tradition has it, we call these shrines and we call these temples. Um, then there are castle buildings, which essentially are built over quite a brief period of time. Um, uh, the, the classic ones from the, the 16th to the 17th century, um, multi-story uh, uh, 
military towers, basically equivalent to the donjons, as it were, of Western, the keeps of Western castles. Then we have the elite houses of the upper classes, their playful imitation, as it were, of um, ordinary people's architecture used for tea ceremony and the uh, uh, more relaxed uh, interaction between individuals than is possible in the for more formal uh, aristocratic interiors or upper class interiors. So tea house architecture, and then the houses of the ordinary people, the commoners houses, what the Japanese call minka. Um, surviving examples, two from medieval period, 115th, 116th century. Other than that, they're all early modern, so post 1600. Mm. So here are our six categories. So I'm starting with shrines. This is Ise, the shrine of the sun goddess, um, which is a sort of, um, it exemplifies the concept of the uh, a kind of environment that is considered appropriate for a deity. And it must be clean and the timber must be clean and it mustn't be old and rotten. Um, the areas, you're, if you're dealing with the deity, you're always trying to avoid pollution, uh, any kind of uh, impurity coming in that might uh, besmirch this deity's uh, place as it were so it has to be clean it has to be ritually pure and at Ise this is exemplified nobody but the priests get within these enclosures and the enclosures are not one but you've got um, one inside another the various uh, gakine uh, that surround this complex and the gates that allow you to enter it the buildings are all earth fast post at Ise, other shrines are not necessarily so. And this shrine has basically been rebuilt on a 20 year cycle since the 8th century, though they had a bit of a, a break when Japan was in civil war during the uh, 15th and 16th centuries, but then went back to it. And the reason you see two standing side by side here is because this is the moment at which the shrine that has been standing for 20 years is about to be demolished and the new shrine has been built on the adjacent plot which has stood empty for 20 years except for one symbolic post left in the middle under a little uh, roof of its own. This shrine is now complete, the deity will be transferred to here and this will de be demolished and stand empty for 20 years. And this uh, involves a complete rebuilding in every 20 years. So the idea is the buildings are always new and pure and clean or relatively so. They're earth fast posts. So the fact that posts rot doesn't matter because they're quite thick posts and they've only, the point at which rotting actually happens is where it actually touches the ground if moisture hits it. In the ground, it doesn't rot. Above the ground, if you just keep the building dry, it doesn't rot. So it's that point where it actually deteriorates. But anyway, so this building type, the details, these roof billets, the chi, um, all of the architectural vocabulary has been ossified by this process of rebuilding because the prototype is laid down. Um, some of it may have changed a bit, has changed a bit, but in essentials, it seems to go back to the eighth century and it's deliberately archaic already. So it's telling us about the kind of architecture that existed in Japan before um, the uh, establishment of Chinese style capital. So there are people who say this is pure Japanese. In fact, it isn't really pure Japanese because there are other influences that were coming in from outside, but it's pre classic Chinese Japanese, if you see what I mean. So very interesting, but it's also an interesting way of, as it were, preserving architectural form. If you can't keep the fabric, 
you can maintain the form by rebuilding the form cyclically within a generation so that the guys who built it a generation before are still alive to tell the next generation of young people how the details will work uh, and this is how, this is the concept and we know that this kind of concept was also applied to palace architecture before the uh, Chinese style capitals start to be built, because in their chronicle of ancient matters, at the beginning of every emperor's reign, it says, this king so-and-so dwelt at this place and ruled the empire. So he built his palace here and he ruled the empire. So at the beginning of every reign, a new palace is being built. So the idea that ritual purity, you know, once someone's died, you don't really want to stay in the building they were in kind of thing. This kind of idea actually did exist apart from religious buildings in the secular sphere in the Coffin period, so way back. So that's this shrine, very um, uh, sort of special shrine case. But this idea of cyclically rebuilding was fairly common in shrines through the ancient period, then gradually it goes into abeyance. Um, this is a much later set of shrine buildings, but this is an Ichinomiya that I actually was involved in working with doing surveys for the local community. This is uh, Ichinomiya Cho in Chiba Prefecture. Now, Ichinomiya. Mia means honorable house and is the word for sometimes a palace, but in this case for a, a deity's house, so a shrine. Ichi means number one. So this is number one shrine for the province of Kazusa. And in ancient Japan, by the end of the Heian period, every province had its shrine. It's number one, it's number two, it's number three shrine. So the shrines were kind of in terms of seniority and that was where the deities who were needed to keep uh, the world working as it were to keep people on side offerings have to be made to deities in order that uh, there should be food that there shouldn't be famine that there shouldn't be floods etc or earthquakes or whatever and if one's happened you must have displeased some deity so you better have a special ceremony to cleanse everybody etc and these buildings are being produced for that purpose this one in uh, Ichinomiya Cho in Chiba prefecture was as I say the Ichinomiya the number one shrine of Kazusa province it's called the actual name of the Jinja is Tamasaki Jinja and the central buildings are a worship hall called the Haiden, linked to an, uh, a hall in which the deity is uh, uh, summoned and sp spends time in, which is called the Honden. They don't have images usually in these, and in a sense, they are not permanent houses for a deity. They are buildings to which the deity is summoned when a ritual is being held. So at the beginning of the ceremony, they will call the deity with drums and so forth, and the deity will come down from wherever he is into the building that you've prepared for him, and then you can make your offerings and ask whatever you want. Humans do not go beyond the Haiden, except if they're priests who are taking offerings to place immediately in front of the space to which it is felt the deity is coming. Usually the offerings are food offerings, but also sake, because sake is the sacred food for deities, which they can consume any amount of, and we probably shouldn't. Um, not any amount anyway. So that's the central bit. And then around that, you've got other buildings. This is a dancing uh, building, uh, a buden, within which um, dances could take place. But usually these are on axis with the main building. In this case, there wasn't really space on the axis, so they put it to one side. But this is where dances like um, uh, uh, sort of sarugaku and so forth are take place uh, to give pleasure to the deity. Then we've got these tori, which are the, as it were, the portals marking the entrance to the sacred space. And then we've got office buildings um, and a more modern building that has been put up in this case um, for wedding ceremonies and 
um, for various meetings that they hold. So this has been this was actually you, <laughs> built over a building which they then demolished, which I was involved in surveying, which we hoped we might be able to rebuild, but that didn't work out either. Um, it was rather a shame that they built it there. But this is so this is a complete shrine still operating at New Year. Thousands of people from different parts of Izu will all congregate here on New Year's Eve or on the first two or three days of New Year to make their offerings and make their wishes for the year and call on the, the deity. And the deity, the main deity who is enshrined here is supposedly the mother of the first emperor of Japan, Jimu Tenno, his mother, um, who is called Tamayori Hime, so hence Tamasaki Jinja, I think. Anyway, so that is the shrine. So this is the, the overall. This is that high den, and this is a detail. They had repaired the building and then relacquered the entire surface. Often these buildings are these shrine buildings are lacquered red like temple buildings, but in Chiba Prefecture, both here, both here and at Katori Jingu, which is another big Chiba Prefecture um, shrine uh, complex, it's black lacquer. The whole thing covered in black lacquer with gilded metal fittings and some of the details picked out in other colors and when it was when it's newly done it's absolutely beautiful the whole thing just glows and reflects the light and this is a photograph of it in that state a lot of ginger buildings are much much smaller than this um this is a little nagare style shrine it's just one bay in length and one bay across and it has a projecting uh, roof at the front over the steps which uh, bring you up to a high raised floor and offerings will be placed in front and or placed immediately at the top of the steps by the priests. This is a more typical example and it's got the Hiwadabuki roof that I showed you earlier. This is at Ujigami Jinja uh, in Uji. <clears throat> uh, which is also where the Biodo Inn is near, near Kyoto. Yeah? This is an even smaller example in Ichinomiya Cho, where I just showed you the Ichinomiya. This is one merchant's house. There were a wealthy merchant family in that settlement, and this is their personal shrine to their own Inari son. Inari is the spirit of the rice and the protective deity of the rice, who is usually. Uh, imagined as a fox, because foxes kill the sort of animals like rodents and so forth that steal the rice before humans can get to it to cut it. So Inari, is, in this case, this is a beautiful little shrine, all made in um, keaki wood, so zelkova, very dense grain, very beautiful wood, um, in the mid 19th century. So. Uh, literally a personal shrine and it, a family has one of these of course now they're quite superstitious about them and they're afraid that if they allow it to fall into disrepair their god may get angry with them and they could end up in trouble but um this sort of uh, little structure is now very very difficult to repair and so um it's a problem this one has there are various bits of it that already have broken and to get a carpenter to come in and do this will cost a lot of money but a beautiful little building. So these are shrine structures, okay? Now temples, Buddhist temples. Ancient period, they come in really with the, from the uh, sort of end of the sixth and into the seventh century. And the earliest ones already heavily influenced, not directly from China, but initially coming from Kudara, which is Pekche, which is one of the three uh, kingdoms of the Korean Peninsula at that period, um, with whom the Japanese were in constant contact, saying to the king of Japan, the then Tenno, with uh, this powerful uh, new belief in um, this Buddha figure has come to us from China, and we think you should take it on board because he's very powerful and he can influence the world and keep things running properly um, as powerfully as your local gods can so you'd better have him on side so then we start getting temples built in japan heavily influenced initially from kudara but then looking directly to china this is an eighth century temple 
the entire layout is known from excavation. The only building that survives from the 8th century is actually this pagoda. But because they excavated the whole site, they know the footprint of the buildings, and they have now more or less rebuilt most of this. This is Yakushiji in Nishinokyo on the western side of what was the Heijo capital, which is now Nara. So what we have is uh, a central golden hall within which you have images of uh, various Buddhas. And then you have the pagoda, which initially was the central element, but then moves to the side and becomes sort of often doubled as flanking elements to a central hall. The axial planning comes from uh, China, but also, also I think ultimately from India as well very strong in Chinese architecture right the way through, and the Japanese take it on board both for their palace planning and for their temple planning, uh, particularly in the ancient period. So the central axis and on that stands the golden hall and then flanked by two pagodas. Under the pagodas are placed Buddhist relics. So a tooth of the Buddha or a Buddha or something like that, or a bit of a bone or something that was once used by uh, a person who has become a Buddha um, or traditionally is believed to be so put underneath and so this is a kind of sacred the original idea is that it's a sacred um, tomb it's a tomb um, and the earliest forms in India and so forth are in the forms of what we call well the, the Indian term is stupa and they are tombs uh, structures, they're domical tombs, quite like the kind of domical tombs that we find in, in uh, for example, uh, the Tholos tombs in uh, Mycenaean Greece, etc. And you've got them in uh, uh, also in the Kofun and so forth. So it's a very widespread concept. But the Japanese ones and the Chinese ones move away from that to basically creating timber towers to mark the spot, the spot, which relate to timber viewing towers that existed in Chinese elite palace architecture. So those sort of build, then these sacred buildings contained within an enclosure to the rear of the Golden Hall is the corridor, the building where the monks gather to read sutras and to hold meetings. Behind that is the dining hall, the jikido, where the monks gather to have their meals, and then flanking that are the sobo, the ranges of cells within which monks live, and they are in two rows, a bigger one at the front, a smaller one at the rear. These are for senior monks, and their servant monks live in the rear row uh, and look after the senior monks, and then the senior monks look after the images and and uh, uh, read the sutras which keep the images happy. And when visitors come who want to petition the Buddhas to help them, then they will stand in the gate or under this cloister, which is not a perambulating cloister, but effectively a kind of viewing stand cloister, which also cuts this space off from the outside world. So you can only get into it through the gate. So creating, uh, an enclosed sacred space that you can only enter if you've been uh, permitted to get in there by the monks. And then they, the monks will present to the, de the uh, Buddhas in the, the image hall your offerings and uh, conduct the rituals to petition the Buddhas to do things for you, and you will watch um, uh, from around the periphery. That's how it works in the ancient temples. And this is sort of a diagrammatic plan of that. These side wells, this is guests visiting um, that the abbot would probably use this building and receive important visitors who might be aristocrats and so forth, and then he would take them to conduct the ceremonies. To the rear of all this, there were a lot of other uh, ancillary enclosures where food was prepared for the, the monks eating in the uh, dining hall. Um, the craftsmen who made the buildings, the craftsmen who made the bronze or wooden images of the Buddhas, the craftsmen who made the, 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 the uh, uh, silk uh, vestments and so forth, all of these the temple had to have. So it's an entirely 
has to be an entirely sort of self-supporting community at this stage. Market economics has hardly taken off. It's you control the people who make the uh, uh, buildings that you see there. This is theoretically the oldest timber building in the world. This is the hall of the Golden Hall of Horyuji, and beyond it is the five-story pagoda of Horyuji. Um, this building now has a lower uh, hisashi around its main space um, called a mokoshi, which originally it didn't have. And when it didn't have it, you can see the incredible depths of these eaves. And in fact, it was too deep, it couldn't actually work. So when they put the mokoshi in, they're actually supporting this deep eaves on this roof. And they've got the same problem at the upper level. So at the corner, later on, they intrude these posts, which have dragons uh, carved around them, which actually help to support these otherwise eaves that actually were more than their technology could make to work. But the idea of we want eaves as deep as possible is very clearly expressed. Note that the ground floor, as it were, the building set on a, an earth podium faced with stone, but is otherwise unfloored, except that the central zone has a timber raised floor, which the images stand on. The upper floor is entirely aesthetic. You can't get into this space and it has no function. So the idea of making an upper floor, although it has a surrounding balcony, it's actually just for show. In China, they were using upper floors. In Japan, they wanted it to show that it was a prestigious building, but they weren't interested in actually making it a usable space. The same is true of the pagodas. The upper floors of the Japanese pagodas are pretty much all of them inaccessible and unusable, although they have little balconies going round them. Um, but uh, the Chinese ones in China, there are examples where actually you can get up floor by floor and within each floor there are images. Um, Japanese didn't do that, but they have some of the oldest timber towers in surviving in Asia. Horyuji's golden uh, uh, Gorjun five-story pagoda is a seventh century rebuild. The original burnt down probably in the 670s and rebuilt by around the end of the century, but in a style that was already archaic. This is the surviving pagoda of the temple that I first showed you, uh, Yakushiji, which goes back to about 830 or thereabouts. And originally, this is actually a three-story pagoda with intervening uh, cantilevered uh, galleries with each with its own mokoshi roof. Um, so a very, a diff it's not a six-story pagoda, which is what it looks like. It's a three-story pagoda with intervening roofs. Uh, and then at the top of it is this shirin uh, element, which actually here you have an element which is the form of a stupa, realized in metal and set on top of this tower. So this is the kind of the actual stupa element. This whole assembly on a larger stupa set at on the on the ground directly is the kind of uh, uh, tor or pagoda that we see in Tibet, for example, quite a lot of them. So these things will go round and round. They're um, circulating in Japan. They're metal and they're way up there and they're simply symbolic. The original would have been colored like this. So red for the timber finish and white uh, uh, plastered panels between. And later on, some of them were more multicolored, particularly internally. Jumping a thousand years to again multi structure Buddhist uh, structures, this is uh, the, uh, a, a, it's sort of iconic. This is the uh, golden pavilion of uh, Rokuonji, often known as Kinkaku because. Uh, Kinkakuji, because this building, the Golden Pavilion in Japanese is Kinkaku. This was actually built as the Shariden, that is to say, it's a sort of hall in which a Buddhist relic was kept within the retirement villa of the third of the Ashikaga shoguns, the, the uh, 14th century shogun, Ashikage Yoshimitsu, 
uh, he retires, stops being shogun and, be, and actually controls the politics from retirement, but he builds himself a retirement villa. The one structure from that villa that survives is the Shariden. Whether it was, it was, it's been known as Kinkaku for a long time, whether it was originally entirely covered with gold as it now is, is uh, slightly uh, questionable, but at any rate, it now is. This building, sadly, the original uh, was burnt down by a mad monk in the 1950s, a monk who had a grudge set fire to it, and the whole thing was lost. But of course, it was already a, 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 a cultural property, and there were survey buildings, so they were able to completely recreate it in form, but it isn't original anymore. Uh, so it lost its uh, national treasure status. But it is a very striking uh, Buddhist uh, building. But Essentially, um, the lower level posts are uh, residential style. The next level up is what you might call Wayo Buddhist style. And then the top level has uh, Katomado and is Zen style. So it has three different styles for each of its floors, but essentially it's residential architecture, multi-story architecture, not with a tiled roof like the earlier um, uh, temple halls, but with the lighter roof of Hiwadabuki. Moving from that sort of multi-story building to this, these are, this is the most famous, the most iconic of Japan's great castle uh, donjons, castle keeps. This is Himeji, um, and a magnificent um, keep five stories on the outside but internally seven and it has two mini keeps uh, accompanying it to make a sort of complex these uh, structures were built in from the, the end of the 16th century the first one put up at azuchi by oda nobunaga um, and he was the one person who actually tried to put a residential uh, complete residential multi-story dwelling within it. Otherwise, they didn't. These are basically fighting platforms. And the idea is that um, you live in the outer wards in a residence in the outer wards of the castle. But if the castle is under attack, at the last, you gather uh, under your daimyo within the fortified center and you fight to the death. Uh, and with luck, the enemy won't be able to get in. The base is stone, but on that, this entire structure is timber. So they're timber framed, and then they're using the technique that we've, I was talking about uh, with Chikako san a few minutes ago um, the use of uh, thick plastered walling on the outside, and everything is, on the exterior is covered with plaster so that fire can't start. And even under the eaves, all of the eaves members have straw rope wrapped around them and then plaster attached. So the whole thing is entirely plastered, all the architectural detail. And then the roofing is tile, classic tile. So that also is uh, non-flammable. So the idea is these buildings will not burn. Um, but externally, they're using elements like the karahafu, the Chinese gable, and chidori hafu, these little, uh, uh, mini um, uh, 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 so gabled hipped uh, roof elements decoratively, but also flanking openings from which they can fire. The other thing that's happening during this century is muskets are coming in, uh, imitating the Dutch and the Spanish and the Portuguese who are visiting Japan at this time. The Japanese very quickly learn how to make firearms and they make muskets. And when you're using muskets, the earlier timber buildings are just not uh, strong enough. Not only can they catch fire, but also a soldier standing behind the musket balls go straight through that. But these thick plastered walls, the musket balls don't go through. So this is um, uh, effective against musket fire. They didn't have cannon, really. They never got that. The West didn't, the Westerners didn't teach them how to make cannon. Um, so the whole frame of this one is actually centered on two vast posts, which are huge tree trunks going up six stories, forming the core into which each floor, uh, the, the floor beams are uh, 
tenoned, and then the whole structure. Um, this is another example. This one lost in, at the end of the 19th century when it, it was involved in a little bit of a civil war in Kyushu, Kumamoto Castle. They've recreated it in concrete externally, but this is a drawing which shows the original timber structure, and you can get a sense of how uh, the timber structures actually work uh, in three dimensions. Um, very impressive. And within the basement of this one, we've got a, an earth floored area and a well and cooking facilities. So they could cook within this and keep the, the soldiers who are fighting in here fed. Um, and they've got some tatami floored rooms in this castle. They didn't in many of them, they're just wooden floors, but uh, or maybe up at the top. Um, and uh, so here we have uh, a sort of a nice example of one of those. Okay, so I'm moving on now to uh, palace and residential architecture. Am I still all right for time? If you want me to stop, say so. Should I fast forward? Uh, no, no, it's but uh, it's perfect. I mean, maybe uh, maybe half an hour more or so than okay. yeah. you. Yeah, I'll you... I'll run through. Um, <laughs> so we're now looking at ancient palace architecture, known from excavation because none of the buildings really survive. We have one tiled, what was one of the tiled kind of uh, palace central hall buildings moved to Toshio Daiji where it was reused as the, uh, the uh, sutra hall, the, the uh, corridor for, for the, the reading hall behind the main condor. Um, other than that, None of these, none of the buildings from the palace period survive, but we've got their footprint because the Heijo capital was abandoned in 784 and the whole area reverts to agriculture and no city was put on top of it afterwards. So come the 20th century when people are getting interested in, so what were these places actually like? and archaeological excavation could just take place because it was simply um, agricultural land. So we have the footprint. And in many cases, the buildings were earth fast post. The main, the central buildings are the palace great hall. This is a model of the Daigokuden. They've now rebuilt on the footprint of the, uh, the first Daigokuden, um, a replica in timber, entirely in timber, but this is a model before that went up showing what that's like. So it's basically Chinese architecture with kumimono, with the typical red coloring and white wall panels and a non-existent upper floor to give the building prestige. And that is here. There's another one over here. This model's a bit naughty because actually when this one existed, this one had already been taken down and another sort of palace stood on this site. But this is a model in the Heijo Palace site that you can actually see if you go there. So this is the ceremonial main hall where the emperor sits, raised up on, like the condo of a temple, on an earth podium faced with stone with stairs leading up to it. Then in the space in front of it, flanking halls run down it, within which the administrators of the various ministries gathered and ceremonial duties were undertaken. So this is the ceremonial heart of the palace, but actually the emperor is not living in it. He's living in an enclosure to the rear of it, which as you will see, does not have tiled roofs, does not have red colored posts. It has hiwada roofs, so roofs of bark, like I showed you, and the timber is uncolored and the buildings are still laid out symmetrically at the front. So there's the main hall of the, this space is known as the daidi. Daidi means um, inner rear. So behind the main palace hall is the inner rear and within the inner rear, the daidi, the emperor is actually living. This is his presence hall. Behind the presence hall in which he's uh, conducting sort of mainly ceremonial activities or uh, uh, formal meetings with people is an area which was dominated by the women of his household, his wife and so forth, 
and to this he would repair to be in company with his women so this is more domestic flanking it there's a huge well about here i think this was the inner servery of this palace so this is actually its kitchen and there's a banqueting hall at the front of it so this is domestic architecture at elite level now we're looking Heian period so after Heijo has been abandoned Nara capital abandoned the court moves to Heian which is the current Kyoto earliest it earlier on it's called Heian Kyo the palace of the, the uh, capital of heavenly peace and within that you've got uh, a later version of the kind of palace I just showed you this is the residence of the senior aristocratic family within Heian Kyo, the Fujiwara family, one of their great residences, the, uh, the mansion of the Third Avenue. De, um, in Japanese, it's written Higashi Sanjo Dono, but you can also read it the Chinese way, To Sanjo Den. Uh, nobody knows how they actually pronounced it, I think. People sometimes refer to it as Tor Sanjo, then sometimes as Higashi Sanjo, uh, because it stood against the Third Avenue, the Sanjo, on the east end of the Sanjo uh, Avenue. They, it has a, uh, an ornamental uh, lake or pond at the front with bridges going over it, the main hall is known as the Shinden. So Shinden really means a sleeping hall, but it was the main residential hall of this residence. So it has a sleeping room within it, but it's um, uh, also got a presence uh, chamber as well, or hall as well. Yeah, that's the central element. So this is called, the whole complex is called a Shinden complex. And the style of this architecture, when the, the posts of the main buildings are still circular, not square in cross section, but circular, uh, raised floor houses, very much in the style of the Imperial Palace's residential buildings. Um, and this model is in the uh, Museum of uh, Japanese uh, History and Ethnology the Rekihaku at Sakura in Chiba Prefecture. So if you come into Japan from uh, Narita Airport, it's very convenient to get to because it's actually very close to the airport. And it's a fascinating museum. No Shinden style residences survive, but we have records and there, there is enough information to put together the plan. And this model is based on that. There are also in illustrated scrolls of the period pictures of this actual residence which was used for many ceremonies so for the front part of it the main part of it this is pretty definitely how it was but for the rear part where some of the kitchen structures were we simply don't have the information but we know they must have existed so that part just is a question mark really so this is the uh kind of residence that the aristocracy are building around the 9th, 10th, 11th, into the 12th century. And then the aristocracy go downhill, and basically they've spent all their time, as the emperor has in the capital, having lots of little internal squabbles and so forth, and busily alienating the crown lands, the whole of Japan's then arable, if you like, had at the beginning of the ancient period entirely been placed in imperial ownership. So everybody was using a bit that was essentially being granted them by the emperor. But of course, as time goes on, more land is brought into cultivation. And these aristocrats are ever so naughty, and so were the, the powerful temples, that they tended to deliberately alienate bits of what had been crown land and turn them into private manors. And that was fine for them because it gave them a direct income and newly developed land brought into cultivation also under their control and all the goodies come into them and that's fine but they're sitting there in the capital and they're not going out into the sticks and even the people who are sent out as provincial governors often don't go because they don't want to so they send a deputy out to do it 
And what happens in the provinces is the people who are actually running the manors start to say, well, first of all, they tend to be looking after competing manners of different aristocratic or families back in the capital. So that leads to fights. So they're good at fighting and they're controlling these manners and they're fighting each other and they're becoming very good at that. So they're becoming what's to be the bushy class. Now I'm, this is a deliberate sort of, to, to tell it briefly, sort of simplification of history, but what is happening is you are generating a sort of feudal system. And these guys stop sending the goodies into the capital and take it out at source and increase their resources. And then they use that as a way of supporting themselves. And this ultimately leads to uh, a situation where the warrior class running uh, manors and land in the provinces actually end up running the show. Um, theoretically under a person who theoretically is an imperial appointment, who is a shogun, um, but not all bushy actually until the Edo period actually under direct shogun or control. Um, but anyway, so in the countryside, by the end of the period of the country at war, uh, local daimyo, the great lords who start off as the sort of people who are running local manors and so forth, are powerful enough that they're building residences like this. This is the a reconstruction, again, of something that we know from archaeology. The residence of the, Ichi, of the Asakura family, Asakura family uh, who ruled the province of Echizen as daimyo in the 16th century. And we know the footprint of their castle town and in particular of their own mansion because in uh, 1573, I think it is, Oda Nobunaga attacks it and the whole lot is burnt and the Asakura vanish basically. But in particular for their residence, um, their, the, their moated uh, house, which doesn't actually have yet uh, a multi-story donjon, but it has the residence within a moated enclosure. Um, we have all the foundation stones. It was never even cultivated after it was abandoned. A little temple was set up within this enclosure. And when they excavated in the 20th century, they found all the foundation stones in situ. So they had the entire layout of all the buildings and they had the channels that contained the, that took the runoff from the roofs. So effectively, they can reconstruct. If you understand the architecture of that period, you can reconstruct pretty much the entire uh, framework of it. This is the main uh, 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 Shuden, the Lord's Reception Hall. A later area of structure gives him a big, uh, uh, more. Uh, relaxed residential building at Senegoten, the kitchen building, the Tozamurai, the office of his administrators, a large uh, stable building with rooms along the front for the officials who run the stables, and we get the image of what this is like. This is an early modern example, um, which again we know from plans and had been lost, but they've rebuilt it. So this is in a sense, a modern building. Um, this is an interior of this space showing the beautiful uh, uh, decorative recess, the tokonoma, the staggered shelving recess, the chigaidama, and the entrance to the, uh, what should be the entrance to the nando or the, the sleeping room, the chodai, but becomes uh, an entrance to a space where guards could be posted and the Taimyo would sit here and those who are coming to greet him would be in the space below. So this is uh, the combination of the main reception building and the main uh, service building, the kitchen building, which constitutes the Hommarugoten of Kumamoto Castle, all rebuilt in the 20th century and damaged in the recent Kumamoto earthquake. But it's very convenient where they've rebuilt, there are no sanctions on photographing. 
and also they've been very faithful in terms of materials in terms of finishes where they've got information using it and they're keeping the crafts the incredible lacquering and gilding crafts that existed alive by doing this because the number of buildings that survive is simply not sufficient to keep those sort of people busy so it's actually a, a, it is a form of conservation in a way but within these we're allowed to take photographs if you're in the actual ones they usually take no photographs so you can get the sense of it and you can also get the impression of not what it's like now in an original building which is two or three centuries old where colors have changed faded and so forth it has atmosphere but this gives you a sense of what it looked like when it was new so this is kumamoto this is another one that they've rebuilt at nagoya in the Hommaru Goten of Nagoya Castle. This was actually, this survived until the Second World War. And with the Tenshu, the, the donjon hall in the background of Nagoya Castle, all of this was still in existence until the 1940s. And then American bombing of Nagoya basically did for all of it, the whole thing was lost. But it was already a national treasure, so it had already been surveyed, in the war, they had actually taken out all of the Fusuma with beautiful paintings on them and stored them separately. So they had all the information and for a long time they haven't done it, but now they've rebuilt it in timber. They rebuilt the Tenshu earlier in concrete, but that's now in a parlous state and there is talk and I think they may even have started taking this down and the aim being to reproduce it in the original timber form. So I'm going to give you a quick look at this built architecture i won't really talk much about it um but you can see the kind of gilded fittings on the hafu ita the um uh, the barge boards and the kind of gable detailing the uh, use of a combination of sliding panels um and one of the well wooden sliding panels which can close it off um two to a bay and then um shoji two to a bay so you can actually only open half of it later they produce an arrangement where you have a door box so you can slide the wooden doors entirely out of the way and just have shoji which lightens interiors so this is a cross section through that sort of building a beautiful model that shows the interior which um, was made in nagoya um and i've i've been a bit naughty and taken a scan from a book but this shows you the way in which the Wagoya frame is set on top of the horizontal, um, uh, as it were, base at the top of the lower frame of the building. So up to here is the Jikubu, and then we have Hari and Keta, and then on top of that the Wagoya is constructed. And below we have the different levels of tatami raised floor rooms with the uh, uh, study window bay and the tokonoma the recess bay and then the staggered shelving bay in their uh, classic kind of configuration. And these are views of the reconstructions within Nagoya. Um, you've got a careful nuancing of finish that in this outer set of buildings, the upper part of the walling is still white plaster and the gilding is confined to the area lower down the wall um, below kind of lintel level and also the sliding panels and then in the more uh, the higher level buildings this part gets uh, similar sorts of finish to the lower part of the frame and you also get these kind of coved and lacquered ceilings so very beautifully detailed um, the uh, Ramma, the open trellis work between rooms above lintel level, uh, very decorative, uh, very carefully decorated with lacquer, gilding, colouring and carving and so forth. The detailing of the Kugi Kakushi, which hold the horizontal um, freeze rails, the Nageshi, which are non-structural by this state, but surely clearly symbolic, the kind of nail covers that they were producing. Um, this is a detail of the Tokuga uh, hollyhock symbol, their family crest on uh, the uh, black lacquer that runs round the sliding uh, panels. Um, this is a sliding panel with horizontal 
members and this is the door pull you put your hand onto this to pull the door to slide the door open so these are the kind of detailing that we've got this is the shogun's bath so you actually get into this space slide the door open and get into this and it's heated from the other side so in effect you are in a kind of sauna and you've got hot water in a uh, um, a, a, a metal container which you can splash onto your body and you can rinse yourself off with it but essentially it's kind of a sauna and at this stage they're not actually getting into the water of the bath as the Japanese currently do. This is Nijojo, the one surviving early Edo period um, uh, residence that is almost complete, um, well worth a visit if you should go to Kyoto, a magnificent complex. Now this was actually built within Nijojo, this is um, a building called the Choshukaku, which has now been moved to uh, the Sankeian in Yokohama. This is the kind of building that uh, the daimyo, the, the top class, as it were, in the Edo period, were building for themselves in their uh, landscaped gardens, uh, within which they could hold little tea ceremonies um, and uh informal banquets and it, very often they have an upper floor that you can climb up to a very very tiny space but you can sit up here and have a lovely view over your garden so this kind of building and then you get the more rustic tea house which is deliberately uh imitating the um the architecture of the ordinary people's houses but the idea is that this is the kind of building that a hermit who is actually a person of substance and knowledge builds for himself and um, uh, within a sort of minimal residence but it goes beyond that these spaces become very small and they're entered through an entrance which you can't actually get into unless you bow yourself right down and outside here you can see there is um, a a kind of uh, rack here on which you would place your sword so you go into this space without armament and you have to have bowed your head whoever you are and you enter this space and it's one-to-one -one space a host who is probably the owner of the, the residence that you're visiting uh, and you the guest are one-to-one -one within this tiny three mat space and sometimes the smaller um, and he serves you tea, which he's boiled on a kettle in that space. So this is one to one. And it's very important if you think about the kind of, sorry, um, the kind of space we've been looking at here, spaces on this scale and with this degree of elaboration, in this kind of context, you are never alone. You are always dealing with people in company. If an important person wants to have an individual conversation with another important person this kind of space is a place where he can do it because nobody else is there to listen so it's a curious sort of um playing at being uh poor ordinary people when you're not but also it's providing you with a space where as an individual you the powerful person can make uh, tea or something and give it to another powerful person and you can have an individual private conversation with that person. And I think that's how one can kind of understand why these were so important in the uh, society of the Edo period. So that's the tea house style. Then briefly, Minka, divisible into those which face the street, Machia, which are generally incorporate shops and our merchant houses or craftsmen houses and buildings usually set back within their plot lived in by farmers people who are cultivating their land so those are the big categories but there are also foresters there are also fishermen um, and uh, they might have either kind of residence depending on the context the basis of the vernacular house is it has an unfloored area called a doma and a floored area divided into living rooms those closest to the doma usually being the rooms that the family is using 
sometimes a sleeping room, as you see here, and then um, uh, a room for a visitor, who is usually a house on this scale in the Edo period would be the house of a village headman. So the visitor who is going to be using this space, which the family will usually not use, though it may contain their Buddhist altar for their family ancestors, um, this space is basically for a visitor who is usually a samurai sent by the domain to make sure that the village pays its rice tax or whatever tax is due on it. So he has to be entertained by, um, and any people accompanying him have to be entertained by the senior members of the village community. They are the village headmen, the shoya, the nanushi, uh, and they have slightly bigger houses than the other people. Variety, huge variety of houses across the Minka spectrum, particularly in the latter part of the Edo period, reflecting local needs, the great Gashio buildings of uh, uh, Gifu and uh, Hokoriku, um, basically built like this in order to contain um, several uh, tiers of uh, roof space where they could breed silkworms because silkworms were a cash crop that were theoretically not taxed and the cash crop bought money in and that's why in relatively poor areas up to then they could suddenly build massive houses like this so variety but within that variety we have a whole load of features which make this unmistakably a Japanese residence, the tatami on the floor, the um, uh, tokonoma recess, um, the engawa, the sliding panels, all of that. You know, a house like this is in Okinawa. Only Okinawa has these red tiles and the white torching. Um, and uh, otherwise, <laughs> basically, you know, these sort of features are features that unify. So just as Japanese has its local dialects, but it's all Japanese, so Japanese Minka have their local dialects, but they're all recognizably part of a Japanese domestic architectural tradition. I think I shall end it there because otherwise it kind of goes on forever. I was going to talk about other things, but I will just finish with some comments about focusing first of all on Edo, where we have this city which is entirely built of timber, which by the beginning of the 18th century, by 1700, probably has a population of around a million. And within that massive city, you have uh, a whole range of different kind of, well, these are, this is early Edo period, uh, a screen painting. Uh, these are models reconstructing bits um, which we know from prints or from archaeology or from other documents. So they're pretty accurate. And then the kind of facilities that it had, it had wide span roofed uh, theatre buildings like this. Um, this is a model in the Edo Tokyo Hakubutsukan. It had large uh, dry goods stores which are uh, the prototypes of later department stores. This is the Echigoya, which becomes the Mitsukoshi department store uh, later on. Um, and at this stage, we have tatami space um, under the uh, eaves. So your main um, uh, customers can come to this point. And beyond that point, you've got the shopkeepers who will bring the different things that the customers want to look at to this point, and then they will discuss and get a price and so forth. So we've got these shopping areas. So it's, in a sense, it's a, already a modern city up to a point, but all done in timber. And the point I wanted to end on is, so we have a sort of sustainable materials and we can see that buildings could be reused. But the other fascinating thing about, I mentioned Ichijodani destroyed by Nobunaga and the Asakura Yakata, which is here. And this is a reconstruction of the castle town as it may have looked in the uh, 16th century before Nobunaga burnt it. And this is the Ichijodani Valley today. So the whole of this town has completely gone and because of the way it's built, the entire area can be turned back into agricultural land. So as with the Heijo capital, as with the Fujiwara capital, one after another, these places could be completely reused 
as agricultural land and none of our cities can and i think that is another thing that we can learn that one of the things we really ought to learn is to make our architecture sit on the ground with less substantial foundations so that it can go again so that we can reuse land for other things because at the moment we're just uh, here in japan for instance one looks and you realize in the past you could get rid of cities and reuse it for agriculture but you're never going to get rid of the kind of sprawl that we've created around tokyo today all the way out to chiba so on that point <laughs> well uh martin thank you so very very much for this it went on very late so i'm oh, no uh, no don't great. worry no don't worry it's actually it's i think it's maybe noon in uk so um or in europe thank you so very very much for this fantastic talk if there are any questions um i asked chicago but she had to yeah, leave has, already yeah, so yeah. Uh, david if you have questions or hisaki if you have questions do you want to ask maybe uh oh uh, no uh if there are no questions i think uh, between us let's continue the discussion on third of uh, june Okay. And uh, we've already taken so much of your time. So That's thank you right. so very, very much. And well, looking hope, forward and if, to, if people yeah. interested in Japanese architecture, it is uh, it's a fascinating area. And I'm very grateful to have had the opportunity to study it. Um, there have been all sorts of things which are uh, less easy to cope with here. That's certainly been true. But in terms of my subject, I've always found it really fascinating. Um, and the incredible thing is that although, um, say compared with England, the density of old buildings is much less, but nevertheless, in terms of, partly because of institutional continuity that old temples have kind of carried on the imperial house has carried on and in the archives of these places where buildings don't survive there are records that tell us about buildings that have been lost and there are enough buildings that do survive for us to get an image of what the ones that they're describing or the documents refer to would have been like and then we have these we have incredible excavation results we have um going back to coffin period we have uh iagata haniwa and things of that sort models of buildings in clay that were in tombs we have these incredible emaki and beautiful um, uh, screen paintings and when you put it all together you can actually fill out the story which is what i was doing looking at uh -huh. the development of the house from palace down to the choir of the ordinary people right the way from Kofun through to the end of edo and that is fascinating because there's so much to learn because in a way japan is like although it's getting influence lots of influences from outside as a political unit it's sort of a unit which never from the uh, maybe in Kofun there was an invasion i think perhaps but after that not really the, the mongols failed until sort of the 20th century no one got in so it's a culture which is to some extent self-contained so it's partly its own story it's internally generated and that is very interesting when you put it in a global historical context because you can see uh you can follow up trends which you can pick up in other cultures and see yep this is when humans create settlements when humans create states when humans create uh, design buildings these kind of things happen. It's really a fascinating study. So in a way, a lot of the time, the Japanese tend to look at it and say, so what's special about Japan? And some, some of the interest actually lies in what's not special about Japan, but general, mm -hmm. and Japan's a good example of it. Mm -hmm. That's uh, fascinating too. Anyway, I won't say any more, but I just to say it, it's been a fascinating experience. and. Um, I feel I need to write, like Professor Yamauchi, I wrote my doctorate, it was far too long and it covered far too much ground, but it really needs to be published now because the more I've looked, I'm pretty sure that actually I was onto something and 
there's things that could be useful. You're thinking of uh, making a book out of your... Uh, I would love to, PhD but there's so them. much of it. And yeah. to make the illustrations, I scanned and copied lots and lots of stuff, but it has, you need permissions to use things. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You have to make drawings of buildings and you have to, because it's my dis thing is basically an analysis of the development of buildings. So buildings are my principal source. Mm -hmm. I'm looking and I'm analyzing the building. So this is archaeology, because yeah? mm -hmm. that's what archaeology does. It looks at artifacts and it looks at the story that the artifacts are telling. And mm -hmm. I'm doing that with buildings. So it's the archaeology yeah, 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 yeah. buildings, whether they're standing or whether I'm doing it from other information. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and in order to convey the relationships between buildings which you can read, it's very visual. And I need the drawings of the buildings all lined up in a way that shows the relationships between them so that anybody looking at it can follow my thinking. Because if it's just in words like that um, Carpenter's Manual, Shaw me, it, we can't contemplate, we can't really grasp it. But if someone draws it out, you can see it. Ah, Naruhodo. <laughs> but maybe you can get funding somewhere to. Well, I, I should have done it before, but I was so no, busy still, trying to run. I mean, you can. I'm, I'm retired now, so. <laughs> yeah, from there, but there are other places where you may not be retired, you know, mm -hmm. uh, in Europe or US or somewhere, you know. I mean, maybe you can find a place where where you can get funding to uh, to uh, realize this, your dream of bringing yeah. that to the public. No? I, I mean, really like to do that. another question I wanted to ask you is really that from my perspective, from my amateur perspective, you know, the concept of a city in Europe is so different than what we can see here, uh, from my perspective. No? Let's say my I'm from Vienna. Well, take Cambridge, for example. Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, it, Trinity College has been there for like 500 years. And, and the out, then, I mean, not the newer developments outside, but the center of Cambridge has been more or less the same for, I don't know, 700 years or something or 500 years. Mm -hmm. And whereas, as you said, uh, you know, the Tokyo today looks totally different than the Tokyo uh, you know, 300 years ago. Also, at that time, it was also one of the biggest towns uh, in, in, in the world. No? Mm -hmm. So the concept of, uh, of uh, like here, the towns have this impression of being more like a white port, like, like you also sh showed in this valley, which, uh, which was heavily populated oh, and it's all uh, erased. No? So that is, that, that is a very different concept of a town or a city you know, or an agglomeration. So wh wh what's the deeper connection of that Sorry, it, it, to it, the culture? Or, it, is that because it, of the earthquakes? Or, back to the materials. or is it an independent development? Or? I think it doesn't, make, it's essentially about the materials. Okay. That, um, that's, I think, huge. Hmm. It's not the whole thing, but it's very important. Hmm. Um, the concept of making an architecture that would endure mm -hmm. starts, I suppose, well, it starts in a number of cultures, doesn't it? But one for the West, I suppose you'd say Egypt. Mm -hmm. okay? yeah. And it starts with buildings for the dead. Oh, it yeah, starts yeah. with tombs. Yeah, okay, but you have that in Japan also, this, this yeah. uh, Daisai. Yeah, you had the Kofun, and that's trying to do the same thing. But what the, the, the Egyptians then do is they say, the temples for the deities, who are also eternal beings, should be of stone. And that transition never happened. In Japan. Oh. Because basically they were saying the opposite. They were saying we need to take the building down and rebuild it so it's nice and clean we keep the form but we change the substance yeah, yeah, yeah. and they basically followed that and because the architecture was demountable mm -hmm. they demounted it yeah, yeah, yeah. if you think about the ancient capitals mm -hmm. the big first one is fujiwara kyo mm -hmm. 
which is the Aska capital. Well, it is near, near Nara, no? Outside, near the you south mentioned. end of the, the Narabonchi. Mm -hmm. yeah? And Heijio Kyo is then built at the north end of the Narabonchi. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Fujiwara Kyo is founded in 694. And Heijo Kyo is founded in 710. And that is less than 20 years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they picked up their first capital and they moved it. Mm -hmm. yeah, they yeah. moved the Daigokuden. We know they did. The Daigokuden, the first Daigokuden of Heijo Kyo was the Daigokuden of Fujiwara Kyo rebuild. So yeah, yeah, yeah. they were taking these structures apart. You know, once you have made all those pieces of wood, you don't throw them away. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You move them and you reuse them. Oh, yeah. And the next thing they say is sort of, well, in fact, before they move to Nagaoka Kyo, which happens in 784, Shomu Tenno moves, he founds a second capital at Kunikyo, he goes over to uh, Naniwa no Miya, which is actually Osaka today, oh, yeah. and then he goes to Shigaraki and he makes another one, and then he goes back to Heijo. So oh, yeah. he's moving around. Now, the whole capital didn't move, it is true. Mm -hmm. And then after the death of his <clears throat> daughter, who was a slightly difficult lady, who was a powerful lady, a remarkable lady, I suspect that I'm not a detailed historian of her, but she had an affair with a monk. <laughs> and that was deeply disturbing because one of the things about the theme having a female as tenor was it wasn't so much because they were liberated it was more because a woman as tenor as tenor could not marry really because nobody was of sufficient status so she could not produce an heir so some other male on the other side would be able to put in his family um, afterwards um, I think this is the key to the use of women. I mean, you know, the other people may say, no, 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 you got this wrong. But I think this sort of thing is happening, right? There, this lady, by having a liaison with a monk, terrified them. And they were that worried that they threw uh, Heijo Kyo away and they moved first to Nagaoka. Then a prince dies. So they say, mm, the gods are not happy with this. So they then move to the present site of Heian Kyo, Kyoto. And None of those big Buddhist temples leave Nara. They didn't want any of them to come. They found two temples right by the Rajomon at the south end of Heian Kyo, as far from the diary as possible, mm -hmm. Toji and Saiji. And they're trying to, and the temples stay in Nara, basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Yakushiji, Tosho Daiji, Daianji. Korfkuji. And Korfkuji, of course, survives because Korfkuji is the Fujiwara family temple. Oh, yes. So that becomes the, the basically modern Nara city is the Monzen Machi for Korfkuji. Oh. Korfkuji and Ta Kasuna Taisha, oh, yeah. which between them are yeah. the Fujiwara family temple yeah. and the Fujiwara family shrine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that survives, that becomes Nara, and the rest of it just goes back to agriculture, right? Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's so amazing yeah cool. and we don't think like that but the reason yeah. i'm thinking and you see this doesn't go down terribly well with the construction industry i'm sure because yeah, yeah, yeah. everything is about deeper foundations and making buildings to last but if you think about it another way what we are calling development is actually creating desert mm -hmm. you know you can look i have looked I could show you, but I won't because it's on a separate PowerPoint and it's, I mean, it's on this computer, I can show it to you, but the maps of this area, that is to say, the area of Inage mm -hmm. around Chiba, between the time when I was born in 1956 and today, and if you go back to 1956, Inage has almost nothing. Most of it is um, Hatake. Oh, or, yeah, but that's here um, where I live out yeah. in Setagayaku. It's the same. Yeah. Well, I was in Komaba, you know, I took university yeah. in Komaba mm -hmm. campus for five, a uh, couple of years. And uh, they have pictures of what it looked like uh, before the Second World War. At that time, it was an aerospace research center. No? In those days, it was complete countryside there. 
right? So that's true. Yeah? So you can see it being developed. And what is actually happening is we are putting in buildings of a type that have not existed in Japan until the, basically the 19th and 20th centuries with deep foundations, multi-story concrete, steel, etc. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And you cannot imagine this land which a generation ago was potentially um, useful agricultural land ever going back to that. Well, I'm not sure, you know, where I live. You, know, work. you, you could do it, you probably could, but think of the amount of energy that that would yeah, be. But where, I, where I live here now, I live here like 20 years in, in the same area, yeah? and around there, they are rebuilding a lot of these seven, 10, 12 story uh, apartment houses. No? Yes. They rebuild them. Mm -hmm. And uh, at any one time, I, at the moment, they are, they just rebuilt one. They, yeah. Before they rebuilt one here, they rebuilt one right now. And now they are starting two or three in this direction. Yeah. But, and uh, I'm just it's observing that. They, uh, they could. Well, they well, reduce yeah, the they land do, before do, they rebuild. But where you've got to bring the topsoil from somewhere else. Ah, the topsoil, yeah, the topsoil. So somewhere else is going to have to lose its topsoil. In well, order yeah, to that's, it. you're right. Yeah, so, yeah. And in order to build those buildings and destroy those buildings, yeah, now, yeah. the Japanese, with their timber structures, yeah. they, they did have, um, <laughs> well, I mean, they, they weren't just, they weren't just trying to do it with their hands. They yeah, were yeah. using levers, they were using yeah, yeah. winches, they were yeah, using yeah. pulleys, so they could move yeah. quite heavy stuff around, but yeah, it was yeah. all unmechanized. Yeah. So the amount of exhaust gases that were produced to do all that was minimal. Of course, the yeah. materials were all grown materials or just yeah. earth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In synthesizing, if you're making an entire building out of steel, all that steel has to be melted, melted out of its ore, and then if it's going to be recycled, it's got to be melted and then put back into a new form. And all of that, you know, before you've even built the building and you're using it, you've got a huge amount of greenhouse gas that's just created, yeah? and it can never go back to agricultural land. But what I'm saying is that, you know, at the end of the Edo period, even before modern building really starts in Tokyo, you know, the Edo of the Meireki fire of 1657, if at that stage they had said, we'll move Edo, Edo could have gone back to agricultural land because of the way they were building, because they didn't have deep foundations, they had timber frame buildings set on pad stones, you know, you can do it with Dodai, the buildings you know, if you look after a timber frame, like Horyuji demonstrates, it can last you a couple of millennia, no yeah, problem. Yeah. You've just got, you know, wood will last. Yeah, yeah. You build a stone building in England yeah. and the rain falls. Look at, um, well, 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 look at King's College Chapel, a building we all know, an iconic building. How much of the exterior of King's College Chapel is a 16th century building? Not a lot. All because these, the stone the, the, melts. Yeah, of course. The so they have to replace it all. Yeah, yeah. They have to cut mm. it all out before the form is lost and replace the stone. So sure. what's different from what was done at Ise? But with yeah. Ise, you know, if you're doing it with concrete, you've got a similar problem. You're, if it's um, reinforced, now Roman concrete's a different baby. Roman concrete is incredible because Roman concrete is operating entirely in compression. And that is interesting because it inevitably generates really potentially very beautiful arcuated forms. So your buildings have to be vaulted because it's all going to be in compression. And if you do it with reinforcement, you can make boxes, but yeah. you're using steel within a matrix, mm -hmm. which is, first of all, the, there's water in it. Mm -hmm. And if there's salt in the sand that you're using, you're going to lose the steel elements which provide the tensile member that prevents that from collapsing. Mm -hmm. yeah? So you're creating a substance which in itself cannot last very long and you're building it and when you've got you then got to get rid of it because the concrete will has been chemically changed into concrete so it can only become aggregate. 
if you're dealing with unfired earth, you put water on it and it goes back to being mud again and you can start again. You can't ever do that with concrete because you've chemically changed its character and it can only become aggregate. The steel you can reuse and you can get it out. I think uh, we are stop, but coming to the end now. I think let's, uh, we'll, we'll meet soon for the dinner on the 3rd of June, so we can continue the discussion. Maybe Professor Yamanovich, you wanted to say something. And yes. You um, yes. Uh, if it was, please, please. Perhaps I shouldn't be without expressing my thanks and admiration for your great scholarship. Oh, very, and, uh, very enthusiasm. good. Thank you. And, and, and I feel thank greatly you. enlightened. And well, uh, perhaps very sweet of um, you to say so. Thank you so much. You did <laughs> your, you started your research in the engineering faculty of University of Tokyo, mm. which was founded back in 1877 by mm. a group of British engineers. Uh, yes, it was. Uh, uh, some of them the Scottish, but like, uh, I think you on. are reviving <laughs> that. Tradition and that, that's uh, all and I want to that. say. <laughs> Great tradition, isn't it? Well, anyway, well, thank you so much for listening, and I'm sorry if I've gone on rather. No, long. no, no. This was absolutely oh, no. fascinating, and fascinating. Uh, it's fantastic, and I'm really looking forward to our dinner you know, on third of June and continue the discussion. Oh, and uh, Professor Yamanuchi also and uh, Srinivasan uh, is still here. Also, thank you so very much. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you very much. Thank indeed. you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you.